Chapter Fifteen of Cocoa Break Collection, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cocoa Break Collection, Volume Two by Various. Chapter Fifteen. The Bell Princess. A story from India, collected and translated by Maeve Stokes. In a country lived a king who had seven sons. Six of these sons married, but the seventh and youngest son would not marry, and moreover he disliked his six sisters-in-law, and could not bear to take food from their hands. One day they got very angry with him for disliking them, and they said to him, taunting him, We think that you will marry a bell princess. A bell princess? said the young prince to himself what is a bell princess and where is one to be found i will go and look for one but the next day he thought how can i find a bell princess i don't know where to seek for her at last one day he saddled and bridled one of his father's beautiful horses then he put on his grand clothes took his sword and gun and said good-bye to his father and mother and set out on his search they cried very much at parting with him he rode from his father's country for a long long way at length when he had journeyed for six months he found himself in a great jungle through which he went for many nights and days until he at last came to where a fakir lay sleeping the young prince thought i will watch by this fakir till he wakes perhaps he can help me so he stayed with the fakir for one whole month and all that time he took care of him and watched by him and kept his hut clean this fakir used to sleep for six whole months at a time and then he would remain awake for six months when the prince had watched over him for one month the fakir woke for his six months sleep had come to an end and when he saw what care the young prince had taken of him and how clean his hut was he was very much pleased with the king's son and said to him how have you been able to reach this jungle to which no man can come and who are you and whence do you come i am a king's son answered the prince my father's country is a six months journey away from this and i am come to look for a bell princess i hear there is a bell princess and i want to find her can you tell me where she is it is true that there is one answered the fakir and i know where she is she is in the fairy's country whither no man can go this made the young prince very sad what shall i do he said i have left my father and mother and have travelled a long long way to find the bell princess and now you tell me i cannot go where she lives i will help you said the fakir and if you do exactly what i tell you you will find her but first stay here with me for a little while so the king's son stayed for another month with the fakir and took care of him and did everything for him as he did for his own father at the end of the month the fakir gave him his stick and said to him now you must go to the fairy's country it is one week's journey distant from this jungle when you get there you will see a number of demons and fairies who live in it then the fakir took a little earth from the ground and put it in the prince's hand when you have come to the fairy's country in order that they and the demons may not see you you must blow all this earth away from the palm of your hand and then you will be invisible you must ride on till you come to a great plain in the middle of their garden and on this plain you will see a large bell tree and on it one big bell fruit in this fruit is the bell princess you must throw my stick at it and it will fall but you must take care to catch the fruit in your shawl and not let it fall to the ground then ride quickly back to me for as soon as the fruit falls you will cease to be invisible and the fairies and demons who guard the fruit will all come running after you and they will all call to you but take care take care care not to look behind you when they call you ride straight on to me with the fruit and do not look behind you if you do you will become stone and your horse too 
and they will take the bell fruit back to its tree the prince promised to do all the fakir bade him he rode for a week and then he came to the fairy's country he blew the earth the fakir had given him away from his palm all along his fingers just as he had been told then he became invisible he rode through the great garden into the plain there he saw the bell tree and the one fruit hanging all alone he threw the fakir stick at it and caught it in a corner of his shawl as it fell but then he was no longer invisible all the fairies and demons could see him and they came running after him as he rode quickly away and called to him he looked behind at them and instantly he and his horse became stone and the bell fruit went back to its tree and hung itself up for one week the fakir sat in his jungle waiting for the king's son but the moment he was turned into stone the fakir knew of it and he set off at once for the fairies country he walked all through it but neither the fairies nor demons could touch him he went straight to the great plain and there he saw the king's son sitting on his horse and both he and the horse were stone this made the fakir very sad and he said to god what will the father and mother do now that their son is changed into a stone and he prayed to god and said if it be god's pleasure may this king's son be alive once more then he cut his little finger on the inside from the tip to the palm and smeared the prince's forehead with the blood that came from it he rubbed some blood on the horse too all the time praying to god to give the prince his life again the king's son and his horse were alive once more the fakir took the prince back to his jungle and said to him listen i told you not to look behind you and you disobeyed me and so were turned to stone had i not come to save you you would always have remained stone the fakir kept the prince with him in the jungle for one whole week then he gave him his stick and some earth he picked up from the ground on which they were standing and said now you must go to the fairy's country again and throw my stick at the bell fruit and catch it in a corner of your shawl as you did before but mind mind you do not look behind you this time if you do you will be turned to stone and you will for ever remain stone ride straight back to me with the fruit and take care never to look behind you once till you get to me so the king's son went again to the fairy's country and all happened as before till he had caught the fruit in his shawl but then he rode straight back to the fakir without looking behind him although the fairies and demons ran after him and called to him the whole way he rode so fast they could not catch him and when he came to the fakir the fakir turned him into a fly and thus hid him up came all the fairies and demons and said to the fakir there is a thief in your hut a thief where is the thief said the fakir look everywhere for him and take him away if you can find him then they searched and searched everywhere but could not find the prince so at last they went away when they had all gone the fakir took the little fly and turned it back into a king's son a few days afterwards he said to the prince now you have found what you wanted you have the bell princess you came to seek so go back to your father and mother very well said the prince then he got his horse all ready for the journey took the bell fruit and made many salams to the fakir who said to him now listen take care not to open the fruit on the road wait till you are in your father's house with your father and mother and then open it if you do not do exactly as i tell you evil will happen to you so mind you only open the fruit in your father's house out of it will come the bell princess the prince set out on his journey and rode on and on for six months till he came to his father's country and then to his father's garden there he sat down to rest by a well under a clump of great trees he said to himself now that i am in my father's country and in my father's garden i will sit and rest in this cool shade and when i am rested i will go up to the palace he bathed his face and his hands in the well and drank some of its water then he thought 
surely now that i am in my father's country and in his garden i need not wait till i get to his palace to open my bell fruit what harm can happen if i do open it here so he broke it open in spite of all the fakir had told him and out of it came such a beautiful girl she was more beautiful than any princess that ever was seen so beautiful that the king's son fainted when he saw her the princess fanned him and poured water on his face and presently he recovered and said to her princess i should like to sleep for a little while for i have travelled for six months and am very tired after i have slept we will go together to my father's palace so he went to sleep and the princess sat by him presently a woman came to the well for water and she said to herself see here is the king's youngest son what a lovely princess that is sitting by him what fine clothes and jewels she has on and the wicked woman determined to kill the princess and to take her place then she came up to the beautiful girl and sat down beside her and talked to her listen to me princess she said at last let us change clothes with each other give me yours and i will give you mine the princess thinking no harm did as the woman suggested and now said the woman let me put on your beautiful jewels the princess gave them to her and then the wicked wicked woman said to her let us walk about this pretty garden and look at the flowers and amuse ourselves by and by she said princess let us go and look at ourselves in the well and see what we look like you in my clothes and i in yours the young girl consented and they went to the well as they bent over the side to look in the wicked woman gave the princess a push and pushed her straight over the edge into the water then she went and sat down by the sleeping prince just as the princess had done when he awoke and saw this ugly wicked woman instead of his bell princess he was very much surprised and said to himself a little while ago i had a beautiful girl by me and now there is such an ugly woman it is true she has on the clothes and jewels my bell princess wore but she is so ugly and there is something wrong with one of her eyes what has happened to her then he said to this wicked woman whom he took for his bell princess what is the matter with you has anything happened to you why have you become so ugly she answered till now i have always lived in the bell fruit it is the bad air of your country that has made me ugly and hurt one of my eyes the prince was ashamed of her and very very sorry how shall i take her to my father's palace now he thought my mother and all my brother's wives will see her and what will they say however never mind i must take her to my house and marry her i cannot think what can have happened to her then he got a palanquin and took her up to the palace his father and mother were very glad that their youngest son had come back to them but when they saw the wicked woman and heard she was his bell princess they and every one else in the palace said can she be a bell princess she is not at all pretty and she is not at all pleasant she was lovely when she came out of the fruit said the prince no one ever saw such a beautiful girl before i cannot think what has happened to her it must be the bad air of this country that has made her so ugly then he told them all about his journey to the jungle where he had met the fakir and how with the fakir's help he had found his bell princess and how he had opened the fruit in his father's garden and then fallen asleep the king made a great wedding feast for his son and he and the wicked woman were married and all the time the king's youngest son thought he was marrying the bell princess meanwhile the beautiful girl had not been drowned in the well but had changed into a most lovely pink lotus flower this flower was first seen by a man from the village who came to the well for water what a lovely lotus flower said the man i must gather it but when he tried to reach it the flower floated away from him then he went and told all the people in the village of the beautiful flower and then the palace servants heard of it they all tried to gather it but could not for the flower always went just out of their reach then the king and his six elder sons heard of it 
and they came to the well but the king tried in vain to gather it and his six sons too the lotus flower always floated away from them last of all the youngest prince heard of the lotus and he grew very curious to see it and said i will try if i cannot gather this wonderful flower that no one can touch so he too came to the well and stooped and stretched out his hand and the minute he did so the flower floated of itself into his hand then he was very happy and proud and he took the flower up to his wife and showed it to her just see he said every one in the village and the palace were talking of this lotus flower and every one tried to gather it and no one could for the flower would not let any one touch it my father tried and my brothers all tried and they too could not gather it but as soon as i stretched out my hand the flower floated into it of itself when his wicked wife saw the flower she said nothing but her heart told her it was the beautiful girl she had pushed into the well the prince laid the flower on his pillow and was very glad and happy as soon as he had gone out his wife seized the lotus flower tore it to bits and threw them far away into the garden in a few days a bell tree was growing on the spot where she had thrown the pieces of the lotus flower on it grew one big bell fruit and it was so fine and large that every one in the village and the palace tried to gather it but no one could touch it for the fruit always went just out of reach the king and his six elder sons also tried but they could not touch it the youngest prince heard of this fruit so he said to his wife i will go and see if i can gather this bell fruit that no one can even touch the wicked woman's heart said to her in the bell fruit is the bell princess but she said nothing the prince went to the bell tree the bell fruit came into his hand and he broke it off the tree and brought it home to his wife see he said here is the bell fruit it let me gather it at once and he was very proud and happy then he laid the fruit on the table in his room when he had gone out the wicked wife came and took the fruit and flung it away in the garden in the night the fruit burst in two and in it lay a lovely tiny girl baby the gardener as he went round the garden early in the morning found the little baby and he wondered who had thrown away the beautiful fruit and who the lovely baby girl could be she was so tiny and so pretty and the gardener was delighted when he saw her for he had no children and thought god had sent him a little child at last he took her in his arms and carried her to his wife see he said we have never had any children and now god has sent us this beautiful little girl his wife looked at the child and she was as delighted with her as her husband was yes she said god has sent us this child and she is certainly most beautiful i am very happy but i have no milk for her if only i had milk for her i could nurse her and she would live and the gardener's wife was very sad to think she had no milk in her breast for the little child then her husband said let us ask god to send you milk for her so they prayed to god and worshipped him and god was pleased with them both and sent the gardener's wife a great deal of milk the little girl now lived in the gardener's house and he and his wife took the greatest care of her and were very happy to think they had now a child she grew very fast and became lovelier every day she was more beautiful than any girl that had ever been seen and all the people in the king's country used to say how lovely the gardener's daughter is she is more beautiful than any princess the king's youngest son's wicked wife heard of the child and her heart told her she is the bell princess she said nothing but she often thought of how she could contrive to have her killed one day when the gardener's daughter was seven years old she was out in her father's garden making a little garden of her own near the house door while she was busy over her flowers the wicked woman's cow strayed into the garden and began eating the plants in it the little girl would not let it make its dinner off her father's flowers and grass but pushed it out of the garden the wicked woman was told how the gardener's daughter had treated her cow so she cried all day long and pretended to be ill 
when her husband asked her what was the matter she answered i am sick because the gardener's daughter has ill-treated my cow she beat it and turned it out of her father's garden and then said many wicked things if you will have the girl killed i shall live but if you do not kill her i shall die the prince at once ordered his servants to take the gardener's daughter the next morning to the jungle and there kill her so the next morning early the servants went to the gardener's house to take away his daughter he and his wife cried bitterly and begged the servants to leave the girl with them they offered them a great many rupees saying take these rupees and leave us our daughter how can we leave you your daughter said the servants when the king's youngest son has ordered us to take her to the jungle and kill her that his wife may get well so they led the girl away and as they went to the jungle they said to each other how beautiful this girl is they found her so beautiful that they grew very sorrowful at the thought of killing her they took the girl to a great plain which was about ten miles distant from the king's country but when they got there they said they could not kill her she was so beautiful that they really could not kill her she said to them you were ordered to kill me so kill me no they answered we cannot kill you we cannot kill you then the girl took the knife in her own hand and cut out her two eyes and one eye became a parrot and the other a mina then she cut out her heart and it became a great tank her body became a splendid palace and garden a far grander palace than was the king's palace her arms and legs became the pillars that supported the veranda roof and her head the dome on top of the palace the prince's servants looked on all the time these changes were taking place and they were so frightened by them that when they got home they would not tell the prince or any one else what they had seen no one lived in this wonderful house it stood empty in its garden by its tank and the parrot and mina lived in the garden trees some time afterwards the youngest prince went out hunting and towards evening he found himself on the great plain where stood the wonderful palace he rode up to it and said to himself i never saw any house here before i wonder who lives here he went through the great gate into the garden and then he saw the large tank and how beautiful the garden was he went all through the garden and was delighted with it and he saw that it was beautifully kept and was in perfect order then he went into the palace and went through all the rooms and wondered more and more to whom this beautiful house could belong he was very much surprised too at finding no one in the palace though the rooms were all splendidly furnished and very clean and neat my father is a great king he said to himself and yet he has not got a palace like this it was now deep night so the prince knew he could not go home till the next day never mind he said i will sleep in the veranda i am not afraid though i shall be quite alone so he lay down to sleep in the veranda and while he lay there the parrot and mina flew in and they perched near him for they knew he was there and they wanted him to hear what they said to each other then they began chattering together and the parrot told the mina how the prince's father was king of the neighboring country and how he had seven sons and how six of the sons had married six princesses but this prince who was the youngest son would not marry and what is more he did not like his brother's wives at all then the birds stopped talking and did not chatter any more that night the prince was very much surprised at the birds knowing who he was and all about his dislike to his brother's wives the next morning he rode home and there he stayed all day and would not talk his wife asked him what is the matter with you why are you so silent my head aches he answered i am ill but towards evening he felt he must go back to the empty palace on the great plain so he said to his wife i am going out to eat the air for a little while then he got on his horse and rode off to the palace as soon as he had laid himself down in the veranda 
the parrot and the mina perched near him and the parrot told the mina how the prince had heard of the bell princess and all about his long journey in search of her and how he found the bell fruit and how he was turned to stone then he stopped chattering and the birds said nothing more to each other that night in the morning the king's son rode home and was as silent and grave as he had been before he told his wife his head ached when she asked him whether he was ill that night he again slept in the veranda of the strange palace and heard a little more of his story from the birds the next day he was still silent and grave and his wife was very uneasy i am sure the bell princess is alive she said to herself and that he goes every night to see her then she asked him why do you go out every evening why do you not stay at home i am not well he answered so i go to my mother's house the prince had a little house of his own in his father's compound i will not sleep at home again till i am well that night he lay down to sleep again in the veranda of the great empty palace and heard the parrot tell the mina all that happened to the prince up to the time that he fell asleep in his father's garden with the beautiful bell princess sitting beside him on the fifth night the prince lay down to sleep again in the veranda of the palace on the great plain and watched eagerly for the little birds to begin their talk this night the parrot told how the wicked woman had come and taken the bell princess's clothes and thrown her down the well how the princess became a lotus flower which the wicked wife broke to bits how the bits of the lotus flower turned into a bell fruit which she threw away how out of the fruit came a tiny girl baby that the gardener adopted how the wicked woman persuaded the prince to have this girl killed when she was seven years old how he and the mina had once been this girl's eyes how the tank was once her heart and how her body had changed into this palace and garden while her head became the dome on top of the palace then the mina asked the parrot where the bell princess was cannot she be found said the mina yes said the parrot she can be found but the king's youngest son alone can find her and he is so foolish he believes that his ugly wicked wife is the beautiful bell princess and where is the bell princess asked the mina she's here said the parrot if the prince would come one day and go through all the rooms of this palace till he came to the centre room he would see a trap door in the middle of that room if he lifted the trap door he would see a staircase which leads to an underground palace and in this palace is the bell princess and can no one but the prince lift the trap door asked the miner no one answered the pirate it is god's order that only the king's youngest son can lift the trap-door and find the bell princess the next day the young prince went through all the rooms of the palace instead of going home when he came to the centre room he looked for the trap-door and when he had lifted it he saw the staircase he went down it and found himself in the underground palace which was far more beautiful than the one above ground it was full of servants and in one room a grand dinner was standing ready in another room he saw a gold bed all covered with pearls and diamonds and on the bed lay the bell princess day and night she prayed to god and read a holy book she did nothing else when the prince went into her room and she saw him she was very sad not happy for she thought he's so foolish he knows nothing of what has happened to me then she said to him why did you come here go home again to your father's palace the prince burst out crying see princess he said i knew nothing of your palace i only found it by chance five nights ago i have slept here in the veranda for the last five nights and only last night did i learn what had happened to you and how to find you i know it is true she said that you knew nothing of what happened to me but now that you have found me what will you do i will go home to my father's palace he answered and make everything ready for you and then i will come and marry you and take you home so it was all settled and he ate some food and returned to his father 
he told his father and mother all that had happened to the bell princess and how her body had turned into the beautiful garden and palace that stood on the big plain and of the little birds and of the underground palace in which she now lived so his father said that he and the prince's mother and his six brothers and their wives would all take him in great state to the palace and marry him to the beautiful bell princess and that then they would all return to their own palace and all live together but first the wicked woman must be killed said the king so he ordered his servants to take her to the jungle and kill her and throw her body away so they took her away at four o'clock in the afternoon and killed her one morning two or three days later the prince and his father and mother and brothers and sisters-in-law went to the great palace on the wide plain and there in the evening the king's youngest son was married to the bell princess and when his father and mother and brothers and his brother's wives saw her they all said it is quite true she is indeed a bell princess after the wedding they all returned to the king's palace and there they lived together but the king and his sons used often to go to the palace on the great plain to eat the air and they used to lend it sometimes to other rajas and kings end of chapter fifteen recording by maricel qui end of coco break collection volume two by various Chapter 7 of Coco Break Collection, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Russet Macmillan. Coco Break Collection, Volume 2 by Various. Chapter 7. Child Roland by Flora Annie Steele. Child Roland and his brothers twain were playing at the bowl. Their sister, Bird Helen, she played in the midst among them all. For Bird Helen loved her brothers, and they loved her exceedingly. At play she was ever their companion, and they cared for her, as brothers should. And one day, when they were at ball close to the churchyard, Child Roland kicked it with his foot and caught it on his knee. At last, as he plunged among them all o'er the church, he made it flee. Now Child Roland was Bird Helen's youngest, dearest brother, and there was ever a loving rivalry between them as to which should win. So with a laugh, Bird Helen round about the aisle to seek the ball is gone. Now the ball had trundled to the right of the church, so as Bird Helen ran the nearest way to get it, she ran contrary to the sun's course, and the light, shining full on her face, sent her shadow behind her. Thus that happened which will happen, at times, when folk forget and run widdershins, that is, against the light, so that their shadows are out of sight and cannot be taken care of properly. Now what happened you will learn by and by. Meanwhile Bird Helen's three brothers waited for her return. But long they waited, and longer still, and she came not back again. Then they grew alarmed, and— they sought her east, they sought her west, they sought her up and down, and woe were the hearts of her brethren, since she was not to be found. Not to be found anywhere. She had disappeared, like dew on a May morning. So at last her eldest brother went to great Merlin the magician, who could tell and foretell, see and foresee, all things under the sun and beyond it, and asked him where Bird Helen could have gone. Fair bird Helen, said the magician, must have been carried off with a shadow by the fairies when she was running round the church widdershins, for fairies have power when folk go against the light. She will now be in the dark tower of the king of Elfland, and none but the boldest knight in Christendom will be able to bring her back. If it be possible to bring her back, said the eldest brother, I will do it, or perish in the attempt. "'Possible it is,' quoth Merlin the magician gravely. "'But woe be to the man or mother's son who attempts the task, "'if he be not well taught beforehand what he is to do. "'Now the eldest brother of fair bird Helen was brave indeed, 
danger did not dismay him. So he begged the magician to tell him exactly what he should do and what he should not do, as he was determined to go and seek his sister. And the great magician told him and schooled him, and after he had learned his lesson right well, he girt on his sword, said good-bye to his brothers and his mother, and set out for the dark tower of Elfland to bring Bird Helen back. But long they waited, and longer still, with doubt and muckle pain, but woe were the hearts of his brethren, for he came not back again. So, after a time, Bird Helen's second brother went to Merlin the magician, and said, School me also, for I go to find my brother and sister in the dark tower of the king of Elfland, and bring them back. For he also was brave indeed, danger did not dismay him. Then, when he had been well schooled and had learnt his lesson, he said good-bye to child Roland, his brother, and to his mother the good queen, girt on his sword, and set out for the dark tower of Elfland to bring back Bird Helen and her brother. But long they waited, and longer still, with muckle doubt and pain, and woe were his mother's and brother's hearts, for he came not back again. Now when they had waited and waited a long, long time, and none had come back from the dark tower of Elfland, child Roland, the youngest, the best beloved of Bird Helen's brothers, besought his mother to let him also go on the quest, for he was the bravest of them all, and neither death nor danger could dismay him. But at first his mother, the queen, said, Not so. You are the last of my children. If you are lost, all is lost indeed. But he begged so hard that at length the good queen his mother bade him God speed, and girt about his waist his father's sword, the brand that never struck in vain. And as she geared it on, she chanted the spell that gives victory. So child Roland bade her good-bye, and went to the cave of the great magician Merlin. Yet once more, master, said the youth, and but once more, tell how man or mother's son may find bird Helen and her brothers twain in the dark tower of Elfland. My son, replied the wizard Merlin, there be things twain. Simple they seem to say, but hard are they to perform. One thing is to do, and one thing is not to do. Now the first thing you have to do is this. After you have once entered the land of fairy, whoever speaks to you, you must out with your father's brand and cut off their head. In this you must not fail. And the second thing you have not to do is this. After you have entered the land of fairy, bite no bit, sup no drop for if in elfland you sup one drop or bite one bit never again will you see middle earth then child roland said these two lessons over and over until he knew them by heart so well schooled he thanked the great master and went on his way to seek the dark tower of elfland and he journeyed far and he journeyed fast until at last on a wide moorland he came upon a horse herd feeding his horses and the horses were wild, and their eyes were like coals of fire. Then he knew that they must be the horses of the king of Elfland, and that at last he must be in the land of fairy. So child Roland said to the horse herd, Canst tell me, where lies the dark tower of the Elfland king? And the horse herd answered, Nay, that is beyond my ken, but go a little farther, and thou wilt come to a cow herd who mayhap can tell thee. Then at once child Roland drew his father's sword that never struck in vain, and smote off the horse herd's head, so that it rolled on the wide moorland, and frightened the king of Elfland's horses. And he journeyed farther, till he came to a wide pasture, where a cowherd was herding cows. And the cows looked at him with fiery eyes, so he knew that they must be the king of Elfland's cows, and that he was still in the land of fairy. Then he said to the cowherd, Canst tell me where lies the dark tower of the Elfland king? And the cowherd answered, Nay, that is beyond my ken. But go a little farther, and thou wilt come to a henwife who mayhap can tell thee. So at once child Roland, remembering his lesson, out with his father's good sword that never struck in vain, and off went the cowherd's head spinning amongst the grasses and frightening the king of Elfland's cows. Then he journeyed further, till he came to an orchard, where an old woman in a grey cloak was feeding fowls. And the fowls' little eyes were like little coals of fire, 
so he knew that they were the king of Elfland's fowls, and that he was still in the land of Fairy. And he said to the henwife, Canst tell me where lies the dark tower of the king of Elfland? Now the henwife looked at him and smiled. Surely I can tell you, said she. Go on a little farther. There you will find a low green hill, green and low against the sky, and the hill will have three terrace rings upon it from top to bottom. Go round the first terrace, saying, Open from within, let me in, let me in. Then go round the second terrace, and say, Open wide, open wide, let me inside. Then go round the third terrace, and say, Open fast, open fast, let me in at last. Then a door will open, and let you into the dark tower of the King of Elfland. Only remember to go round Widdershins. If you go round with the sun, the door will not open. So good luck to you. Now the henwife spoke so fair and smiled so frank, the child Roland forgot for a moment what he had to do. Therefore he thanked the old woman for her courtesy, and was just going on when, all of a sudden, he remembered his lesson. And he out with his father's sword that never yet struck in vain, and smote off the henwife's head, so that it rolled among the corn, and frightened the fiery-eyed fowls of the king of Elfland. After that he went on and on, till, against the blue sky, he saw a round green hill, set with three terraces from top to bottom. Then he did as the henwife had told him, not forgetting to go round Widdershins, so that the sun was always on his face. Now, when he had gone round the third terrace, saying, Open fast, open fast, let me in at last, what should happen but that he should see a door in the hillside, and it opened, and let him in. Then it closed behind him with a click, and child Roland was left in the dark, for he had gotten at last to the dark tower of the king of Elfland. It was very dark at first, perhaps because the sun had part blinded his eyes, for after a while it became twilight, though where the light came from none could tell, unless through the walls and the roof, for there were neither windows nor candles. But in the gloaming light he could see a long passage of rough arches, made of rock that was transparent, and all encrusted with sheep silver, rock spar, and many bright stones and the air was warm as it ever is in Elfland. So he went on and on in the twilight that came from nowhere, till he found himself before two wide doors, all barred with iron. But they flew open at his touch, and he saw a wonderful large and spacious hall that seemed to him to be as long and broad as the green hill itself. The roof was supported by pillars wide and lofty beyond the pillars of a cathedral, and they were of gold and silver, fretted into foliage, and between and around them were woven wreaths of flowers, and the flowers were of diamonds and rubies and topaz and the leaves of emerald, and the arches met in the middle of the roof where it hung by a golden chain an immense lamp made of a hollowed pearl, white and translucent, and in the middle of this lamp was a mighty carbuncle, blood-red, that kept spinning round and round shedding its light to the very ends of the huge hall, which thus seemed to be filled with the shining of the setting sun. Now at one end of the hall was a marvellous, wondrous, glorious couch of velvet, silk, and gold, and on it sate fair bird Helen, combing her beautiful golden hair with a golden comb. But her face was all set and wan, as if it were made of stone. When she saw a child Roland, she never moved, and her voice came like the voice of the dead, as she said, "'God pity you, poor luckless fool! What have you here to do?' Now at first Child Roland felt he must clasp the semblance of his dear sister in his arms, but he remembered the lesson which the great magician Merlin had taught him, and drawing his father's brand, which had never yet been drawn in vain, and turning his eyes from the horrid sight, he struck with all his force at the enchanted form of fair bird Helen. And lo, when he turned to look in fear and trembling, there she was her own self, her joy fighting with her fears. And she clasped him in her arms and cried, 
oh hear you this my youngest brother why didn't you bide at home had you a hundred thousand lives you couldn't spare ne'er a one but sit you down my dearest dear oh woe that you were born for come the king of elfland in your fortune is forlorn so with tears and smiles she seated him beside her on the wondrous couch and they told each other what they each had suffered and done he told her how he had come to elfland she told him how she had been carried off shadow and all because she ran round a church widdershins and how her brothers had been enchanted and lay entombed as if dead as she had been because they had not had the courage to obey the great magician's lesson to the letter and cut off her head now after a time child roland who had travelled far and travelled fast became very hungry and forgetting all about the second lesson of the magician merlin asked his sister for some food and she being still under the spell of elfland could not warn him of his danger she could only look at him sadly as she rose up and brought him a golden basin full of bread and milk now in those days it was manners before taking food from any one to say thank you with your eyes and so just as child roland was about to put the golden bowl to his lips he raised his eyes to his sisters and in an instant he remembered what the great magician had said bite no bit sup no drop for if in elfland you sup one drop or bite one bit never again will you see middle earth so he dashed the bowl to the ground and standing square and fair lithe and young and strong he cried like a challenge not a sup will i swallow not a bit will i bite till fair bird helen is set free then immediately there was a noise like thunder and a voice was heard saying fee fi fo fum i smell the blood of a christian man be he alive or dead my brand shall dash his brains from his brain pan then the folding doors of the vast hall burst open and the king of elfland entered like a storm of wind what he was really like child roland had not time to see for with a bold cry strike bogle thy hardest if thou darest he rushed to meet the foe his good sword that never yet did fail in his hand and child roland and the king of elfland fought and fought and fought while bert helen with her hands clasped watched them in fear and hope so they fought and fought and fought until at last child roland beat the king of elfland to his knees whereupon he cried i yield me thou hast beaten me in fair fight then child roland said i grant thee mercy if thou wilt release my sister and my brothers from all spells and enchantment and let us go back to middle earth so that was agreed and the elfin king went to a golden chest whence he took a phial that was filled with a blood-red liquor and with this liquor he anointed the ears and the eyelids the nostrils the lips and the finger-tips of the bodies of bert helen's two brothers that lay as dead in two golden coffers and immediately they sprang to life and declared that their souls only had been away but had now returned after this the elfin king said a charm which took away the very last bit of enchantment and adown the huge hall that showed as if it were lit by the setting sun and through the long passage of rough arches made of rock that was transparent and all encrusted with sheep silver rock spar and many bright stones where twilight reigned the three brothers and their sister passed then the door opened in the green hill it clicked behind them and they left the dark tower of the king of elfland never to return for no sooner were they in the light of day than they found themselves at home but fair bird helen took care never to go widdershins round a church again end of chapter 7 recording by russet macmillan Chapter 10 of Cocoa Break Collection, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Samantha Miles. 
Cocoa Break Collection, Volume 2, by Various, Chapter 10. The Espousal of the Rat's Daughter, by Grace James. Mr. Nedzumi, the rat, was an important personage in the hamlet where he lived. At least, he was so in his own and his wife's estimation. This was, in part, of course, due to the long line of ancestors from whom he was descended, and to their intimate association with the gods of good fortune. For, be it remembered, his ancestry went back into a remote past, in fact, as far as time itself, for had not one of his race been selected as the first animal in the cycle of the hours, presidents being even given him over the dragon, the tiger, and the horse? As to his intimacy with the gods, had not one of his forebears been the chosen companion of the great Daikoku, the most revered and the most beneficent of the gods of good fortune? Mr. Rat was well to do in life. His home had for generations been established in a snug, warm, and cosy bank, hard by one of the most fertile rice fields on the countryside, where crops never failed, and where in spring he could nibble his fill of the young green shoots, and in autumn gather into his storerooms supplies of the ripened grain sufficient for all his wants during the coming winter. For his needs were not great. Entertainment cost him but little, and, unlike his fellows, he had the smallest of families, in fact a family of one only. But, as regards that one, quality more than compensated for quantity, for it consisted of a daughter, of a beauty unsurpassed in the whole province. He himself had been the object of envy in his married life, for he had had the good fortune to marry into a family of a very select piebald breed, which seldom condescended to mix its blood with the ordinary self-coloured tribe, and now his daughter had been born a peerless white, and had received the name of Yuki, owing to her resemblance to pure snow. It is little wonder, then, that as she grew up beautiful in form and feature, her father's ambitions were fired, and that he aspired to marry her to the highest in the land. As it happened, the hamlet where he lived was not very far removed from a celebrated temple, and Mr. Rat, having been brought up in the odour of sanctity, had all his life long been accustomed to make pilgrimages to the great shrine. There he had formed the acquaintance of an old priest, who was good enough to provide for him out of the temple offerings in return for gossip as to the doings of his village, which happened to be that in which the priest had been born and bred. To him the rat had often unburdened his mind, and the old priest had come to see his friend's self-importance and his little weaknesses, and had in vain impressed upon him the virtues of humility. Now Mr. Rat could find no one amongst his village companions to inform him where to attain what had now become an insatiable desire, namely, a fine marriage for his daughter. So he turned to the temple custodian for advice, and one summer morn found him hammering on the gong, which summoned his friend the priest. "'Welcome, Mr. Rat. To what am I indebted for your visit?' said the old priest, for experience had shown him that his friend seldom came so far afield unless he had some request to make. Thereupon Mr. Rat unburdened himself of all that was in his mind, of his aspiration, and of the difficulty he had in ascertaining in what manner he could obtain it. Nor did the priest immediately satisfy him, for he said the matter was a difficult one, and would require much consideration. However, on the third day the oracle gave answer as follows. There is no doubt that apart from the gods there is no one so powerful or who exercises so beneficent a rule over us as his majesty the sun had i a daughter and did i aspire to such heights for her as you do i should make my suit to him and i should take the opportunity of so doing when he comes down to our earth at sundown for then it is that he decks himself in his most gorgeous apparel moreover he is more readily approached when his day's work is done and he is about to take his well-earned rest were I you, I would lose no time, but present myself in company with your honourable wife and daughter to him this very evening, at the end of the great Cryptomeria Avenue, at the hour when he especially honours it by flooding it with his beams. A thousand thanks, said Mr. Rat. No time is to be lost if I am to get my folk together at the time and place you mention. 
good fortune to you, said the priest. May I hail you the next time I see you as father-in-law to his majesty the son. At the appointed hour, parents and daughter were to be seen in the avenue, robed in their finest clothes, and as the sun came earthwards, and his rays illumined the gloom under the great pines, Mr. Rat, no way abashed, addressed his majesty and at once informed him of his desire. His majesty, evidently considering that one business personage addressing another should not waste time in beating about the bush, replied as follows, "'I am extremely beholden to you for your kind intention of allowing me to wed your honourable and beautiful daughter, O Yuki-san, but may I ask your reason for selecting me to be your honourable son-in-law?' To this Mr. Rat replied, we have determined to marry our daughter to whoever is the most powerful personage in the world, and that is why we desire to offer her to you in marriage. Yes, said his majesty, you are certainly not without reason in imagining me to be the most august and powerful person in the world, but unfortunately it has been my misfortune to discover that there is one other even more powerful than myself against whose plottings I have no power. It is to him that you should very certainly marry your daughter. "'And may we honourably ask you who that potentate may be?' said Mr. Rat. "'Certainly,' rejoined the son. "'It is the cloud. Oftentimes, when I have set myself to illumine the world, he comes across my path and covers my face, so that my subjects may not see me and so long as he does this, I am altogether in his power. If, therefore, it is the most powerful personage in the world whom you seek for your daughter, the Honorable Oyuki-san, you must bestow her on no one else than the cloud. It required little consideration for both father and mother to see the wisdom of the son's advice, and upon his suggestion they determined to wait on the cloud at the very earliest opportunity and at an hour before he rose from his bed, which he usually made on the slopes of a mountain some leagues removed from their village. So they set out, and a long journey they had, so long that Mr. Rat decided that if he was to present his daughter when she was looking her best, the journey must not be hurried. Consequently, instead of arriving at early dawn, it was full afternoon when they neared the summit where the cloud was apparently wrapped in slumber. But he roused himself as he saw the family approaching, and bade them welcome in so urbane a manner that the rat at once proceeded to lay his request before him. To this the cloud answered, "'I am indeed honoured by your condescension in proposing that I should marry your beauteous daughter, O Yuki-san. It is quite true, as his august majesty the sun says, that when I so desire I have the strength to stay him from exercising his power upon his subjects, and I should much esteem the privilege of wedding your daughter. But, as you would single out for that honour the most powerful person in the world, you must seek out His Majesty the Wind, against whom I have no strength, for as soon as he competes with me for supremacy, I must fain fly away to the ends of the earth. "'You surprise me,' said the Rat. "'But I take your word for it. I would, therefore, ask you whether his majesty the wind will be this way shortly, and where I may best meet him. I am afraid I cannot tell you at the moment when he is likely to be this way. He usually announces his coming by harrying some of my subjects, who act as my outposts, but, as you see, they are now all resting quietly. His majesty is, at this moment, I believe, holding a court far out in the eastern seas. Were I you, I would go down to the seashore and await his coming. He is often somewhat inclined to be short-tempered by the time he gets up into these mountainous parts, owing to the obstructions he has met with on his journey, and he will have had few of these vexatious annoyances during his ride over the sea. Now, although from the slopes of the mountain the sea looked not very far distant, it was, in reality, a long way for a delicately nurtured young lady such as Yuki, and every mile of the journey that she had to traverse increased her querulousness. Her father had often boasted of the journeys that he had taken down to the coast, free of cost, concealed in a truckload of rice, 
and she would take no excuses that there was no railway to the point at which they were to await his highness the wind although had there been it would never have done for a party engaged on such an embassy to ride in a railway truck nor was her humour improved by the time they had to wait in the very second-rate accommodation afforded by a fishing hamlet as none of them were accustomed to a fish fair but after many days there were signs that the great personage was arriving and they watched with some trepidation his passage over the sea although when in due time he neared the shore they could hardly credit the cloud's assurance as to his strength for he seemed the personification of all that was gentle and madame rat at once interposed the remark that you should never judge a person's character by what you hear and that the cloud evidently owed the wind a grudge so the rat at once unburdened himself to the wind as it came over the water towards him making its face ripple with smiles and the wind itself was in the fairest good humour and addressed the rat as follows mr cloud is a flatterer and knows full well that i have no power against him when he really comes up against me in one of his thunderous moods to call me the most powerful person in the world is nonsense where do you come from why in that very village there is one stronger than me namely the high wall that fences in the house of your good neighbour if your daughter must fain marry the strongest thing in the world wed her to the wall you will find him a very stalwart spouse i wish you good day i am sorry i cannot offer you a seat in my chariot but i am not going in the direction of that wall to-day else i should have had much pleasure in introducing your honourable self to my powerful antagonist by this time the party was getting much disheartened and the stress of the journey and the chagrin of so many disappointments were beginning to tell on o yuki san's beauty but mr rat said there was nothing for it but to return home he knew the wall in question very well but had no idea it stood so high in the world's estimation he had always thought of it as somewhat of a dullard so they trudged homewards and it was weary work for the cloud had hidden the sun and the wind had fretted the cloud who showed his ill-humour by discharging a surplusage of moisture he had in his pocket and they approached their home wet through bedraggled and worn out as luck would have it just as they gained the wall which the wind had singled out for its power a heavier downpour than ever came on and they were glad to take shelter under the lee of the wall now mr wall had always been known for his inquisitive nature which it is said arose from one side of his face never being able to see what was going on on the other and so hearing his leeward side addressing mr rat and ascertaining that he had come from the sea the windward side at once asked whether he had any tidings of that scoundrel the wind who was always coming and chafing his complexion why said mr rat we met him but recently and he desired to be remembered to you who he said was the strongest person in the world ay the strongest it shows his ignorance why only yesterday your nephew the big brown rat because he would not be at the trouble of going round must needs gnaw a hole through me the strongest thing in the world why next time the wind comes this way he'll rush through the hole and be telling your nephew that he's the strongest person in the world at this moment the rain stopped the clouds rolled by and the sun shone out and mr and mrs rat went home congratulating themselves that they had not had to demean themselves by proposing their daughter in marriage to a neighbour with such a false character and a month afterwards o yuki san expressed her determination to marry her cousin and her parents were fain to give their consent for had he not proved himself to be the most powerful person in the world End of chapter 10 Recording by Samantha Miles Chapter 14 of Coco Break Collection, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Heather Cassavant. Coco Break Collection, Volume 2, by Various. 
Chapter Fourteen The Fairy of the Dell by P. H. Emerson. In olden times, fairies were sent to oppose the evil doings of witches and to destroy their power. About three hundred years ago, a band of fairies, sixty in number, with their queen, called Queen of the Dell, came to Mona to oppose the evil works of a celebrated witch. The fairies settled by a spring in a valley. After having blessed the spring, or well as they called it, they built a bower just above the spring for the queen, placing a throne therein. Nearby they built a large bower for themselves to live in. After that, the queen drew three circles, one within the other, on a nice, flat, grassy place by the well. When they were comfortably settled, the queen sent the fairies about the country to gather tidings of the people. They went from house to house, and everywhere heard great complaints against an old witch, how she had made some blind, others lame and deformed others by causing a horn to grow out of their foreheads. When they got back to the well and told the queen, she said, I must do something for these old people, and though the witch is very powerful, we must break her power. So the next day the queen fairy sent word to all the bewitched to conjugate upon a fixed day at the sacred well, just before noon. When the day came, Several ailing people collected at the well. The queen then placed the patients in pairs in the inner ring, and the sixty fairies in pairs in the middle ring. Each little fairy was three feet and a half high, and carried a small wand in her right hand, and a bunch of fairy flowers, cuckoo boots, baby bells, and day eyes, in her left hand. Then the queen, who was four feet and a half in height, took the outside ring. On her head was a crown of wild flowers. In her right hand she carried a wand, and in her left hand a posy of fairy flowers. At a signal from the queen, they began marching round the rings, singing in chorus. We march round by two and two, the circles of the sacred well that lies in the dell. When they had walked twice round the ring singing, the queen took her seat upon the throne, and calling each patient to her, she touched him with her wand and bade him to go down to the sacred well and dip his body into the water three times, promising that all his ills should be cured. As each one came forth from the spring, he knelt before the queen, and she blessed him, and told him to hurry home and put on dry clothes, so that all were cured of their ills. Now the old witch, who had worked all these evils, lived near the well in a cottage. She had first learned witchcraft from a book called The Black Art, which a gentleman farmer had lent her when a girl. She progressed rapidly with her studies and being eager to learn more, sold herself to the devil, who made compact with her that she should have full power for seven years, after which she was to become his. He gave her a wand that had the magic power of drawing people to her, and she had a ring on the grass by her house, just like the fairy's ring. As the seven years were drawing to a close, and her heart was savage against the farmer, who first led her into the pass of evil knowledge, she determined to be revenged. One day, soon after the fairy of the dell came to live by the spring, she drew the farmer to her with her wand, and standing in her ring, she lured him into it. When he crossed the line, she said, Curse be he or she that crosses my circle to see me. And touching him on the head and back, a horn and tail grew from the spots touched. He went off in a terrible rage, but she only laughed maliciously. 
then as she heard of the queen of the dell's good deeds she repented of her evil deeds and begged her neighbor to go to the queen fairy and ask her if she might come and visit the queen consented and the old witch went down and told her everything of the book of the magic wand of the ring and of all the wicked deeds she had done oh you have been a bad witch said the queen but i will see what i can do you must bring me the book and the wand and she told the old witch to come on the following day a little before noon when the witch came the next day with her wand and book she found the fairies had built a fire in the middle ring then the queen took her and stood her by the fire for she could not trust her on the outer circle now i must have more power said the queen to the fairies and she went and sat on the throne leaving the witch by the fire in the middle ring after thinking a little the queen said now i have it and coming down from her throne muttering she began walking round the outer circle waiting for the hour of one o'clock when all the fairies got into the middle circle and marched round singing at the hour of one the cock shall crow one goo 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 i am here to tell of a sacred well that lies in the dell and will conquer hell on the second round they sang at the hour of two the cock crows two goo 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 i am here to tell of the sacred well that lies in the dell we will conquer hell at the last round they sang at the hour of three the cock crows three goo 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 i am here to tell of the sacred well that lies in the dell now i have conquered hell then the queen cast the book and wand into the fire and immediately the veil was rent by a thundering noise and a number of devils came from everywhere and encircled the outer ring but they could not pass the ring then the fairies began walking round and round singing their song when they had finished the song they heard a loud screech from the devils that frightened all the fairies except the queen she was unmoved and going to the fire stirred the ashes with her wand and saw the book and wand were burnt and then she walked thrice round the outer ring by herself when she turned to the devils and said i command you to be gone from our earthly home get to your own abode i take the power of casting you all from here be gone be gone be gone and all the devils flew up and there was a mighty clap as of thunder and the earth trembled and the sky became overcast and all the devils burst and the sky cleared again after this the queen put three fairies by the old witch's side and they constantly dipped their wands in the sacred spring and touched her head and she was sorely troubled and converted bring the mirror said the queen and the fairies brought the mirror and laid it in the middle circle and they all walked round three times chanting again the song beginning at the hour of one when they had done this the queen stood still and said stand and watch to see what you can see as she looked she said the mirror shines on to me that the witch we can see has three devils inside of she immediately the witch had a fit and the three fairies had a hard time to keep the three devils quiet indeed they could not do so and the queen had to go herself with her wand for fear the devils should burst the witch asunder and she said come out three evil spirits out of thee and they came gnashing their teeth and would have killed all the fairies but the queen said be gone be gone be gone you evil spirits to the place of your abode and suddenly the sky turned bright as fire 
for the evil spirits were trying their spleen against the fairies. But the queen said, Collect, 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 into one fierce ball. And the fiery sky collected into one ball of fire, more dazzling than the sun, so that none could look at it except the queen, who wore a black silk mask to protect her eyes. Suddenly the ball burst with a terrific noise, and the earth trembled. Enter into your abode, and never come down to our abode on earth any more, said the queen. And the witch was herself again, and she and the queen fairy were immediately great friends. The witch, when she came out of the ring, dropped on her knee and asked the queen if she might call her the lady of the dell and how she could serve her. We will see about that, said the queen. Well, how do you live? asked the woman who had been a witch. Well, I'll tell you, said the queen. We go at midnight and milk the cows, and we keep the milk, and it never grows less so long as we leave some in the bottom of the vessel. We must not use it all. After milking the cow, we rub the cow's purse and bless it, and she gives double the amount of milk. Well, how do you get corn? Well, we were at the mill playing one day, and the miller came in and saw us, and spoke kindly to us, and offered us some flour. We never take nothing for nothing, I said, so I blessed the bin. So in a few minutes the bin was full to the brim with flour, and I said to the miller, Now don't you empty the bin, but always leave a peck in it, and for twelve months, no matter how much you use the bin, it will always be full in the morning. Now I have told you this much, and I will tell you further. You must love your neighbor, you must love all mankind. Now here is a purse of gold, go and buy what you want eggs, bacon, cheese, and get a flagon of wine, and use these things freely, giving freely to the aged poor, and if you never finish these things, there will always be as much the next morning as you started with, and I shall make a salve for you, and you must use the water from the sacred well, that will be as medicine and people shall come from far and wide to be cured by you, and you shall be loved by all, and you shall be known to the poorest of the poor as Madame Dorothy. And the woman did as she was told, and she became renowned for her medical skill, especially in childbirth, for her salve eased the pains, and her waters brought milk. By and by she got known all over the island, and rich people came to her from afar, and she always made the rich pay, and the poor were treated free. Madame Dorothy used to see the Queen Fairy at times, and one day she asked her, Shall we meet again? We cannot tell, said the Queen, but I will give you a ring. Let me place it on your finger. It is a magic ring worked by fairies. Whenever you seek to know of me, make a ring of your own and walk round three times and rub the ring. If it turns bright, I am alive, but if you see blood, I am dead. But how can that be? You are much younger than I am. Oh no, we fairies look young to the day of our death. We live to a great age, but die naturally of old age for we never have any ailments, but our power fades. Men fade in flesh and power, but we fade only in power. I am over seventy now. But you look to be thirty. Well, we will shake hands and part, for I must go elsewhere, as I have no king, I do not stop in one place. And they shook hands and parted. End of chapter 14 The Fairy of the Dell by P. H. Emerson Recording by Heather Casavant
Chapter 8 of Coco Brake Collection, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Read by Russet Macmillan. Coco Brake Collection, Volume 2 by Various. The Herd Boy and the Weaving Maiden. A Story from China, translated by Frederick H. Martins. The herd boy was the child of poor people. When he was twelve years old, he took service with a farmer to herd his cow. After a few years, the cow had grown large and fat, and her hair shone like yellow gold. She must have been a cow of the gods. One day, while he had a routed pasture in the mountains, she suddenly began to speak to the herd boy in a human voice as follows. This is the seventh day. Now the white jade ruler has nine daughters who bathe this day in the sea of heaven. The seventh daughter is wise and beautiful beyond all measure. She spins the cloud silk for the king and queen of heaven and presides over the weaving which maidens do on earth. It is for this reason she is called the weaving maiden. And if you go and take away her clothes while she bathes, you may become a husband and gain immortality. "'But she is up in heaven,' said the herd boy. "'And how can I get there?' "'I will carry you there,' answered the yellow cow. "'So the herd boy climbed on the cow's back. "'In a moment clouds began to stream out of her hooves, "'and she rose into the air. "'About his ears there was a whistling like the sound of the wind, "'and they flew along as swiftly as lightning. "'Suddenly the cow stopped. "'Now we are here,' said she. Then, round about him, the herd boy saw forests of chrysophrase and trees of jade. The grass was of jasper and the flowers of coral. In the midst of all this splendor lay a great four-square sea covering some five hundred acres. Its green waves rose and fell, and fishes with golden scales were swimming about in it. In addition, there were countless magic birds who winged above it and sang— even in the distance the herd boy could see the nine maidens in the water. They had all laid down their clothes on the shore. "'Take the red clothes quickly,' said the cow, "'and hide away with them in the forest. And though she ask you for them never so sweetly, do not give them back to her until she has promised to become your wife.' Then the herd boy hastily got down from the cow's back, seized the red clothes, and ran away. At the same moment... The nine maidens noticed him and were much frightened. "'Oh, youth, where do you come from that you dare to take our clothes?' they cried. "'Put them down again, quickly!' But the herd boy did not let what they said trouble him, but crouched down behind one of the jade trees. Then eight of the maidens hastily came ashore and drew on their clothes. "'Our seventh sister,' said they, "'whom heaven has destined to be yours has come to you.' We will leave her alone with you. The weaving maiden was still crouching in the water, but the herd boy stood before her and laughed. If you will promise to be my wife, said he, then I will give you your clothes. But this did not suit the weaving maiden. I am a daughter of the ruler of the gods, said she, and may not marry without his command. Give back my clothes to me quickly, or else my father will punish you. Then the yellow cow said, "'You have been destined for each other by fate, "'and I will be glad to arrange your marriage, "'and your father, the ruler of the gods, "'will make no objection. "'Of that I am sure.' "'The weaving maiden replied, "'You are an unreasoning animal. "'How could you arrange our marriage?' "'The cow said, "'Do you see that old willow tree there on the shore? "'Just give it a trial and ask it. "'If the willow tree speaks, "'then heaven wishes your union.' and the weaving maiden asked the willow. The willow replied in a human voice, This is the seventh day. The herd boy has caught to the weaver doth pay. And the weaving maiden was satisfied with the verdict. The herd boy laid down her clothes and went on ahead. The weaving maiden drew them on and followed him, and thus they became man and wife. But after seven days she took leave of him. "'The ruler of heaven has ordered me to look after my weaving,' said she, 
If I delay too long, I fear he will punish me. Yet, although we have to part now, we will meet again in spite of it. When she had said these words, she really went away. The herd boy ran after her. But when he was quite near, she took one of the long needles from her hair and drew a line with it right across the sky, and this line turned into the Silver River. And thus they now stand, separated by the river, and watch for one another. And since that time, they meet once every year, on the eve of the seventh day. When that time comes, then all the crows in the world of men come flying, and form a bridge over which the weaving maiden crosses the Silver River. And on that day, you will not see a single crow in the trees from morning to night, no doubt, because of the reason I have mentioned. And besides, a fine rain often falls on the evening of the seventh day. Then the women and old grandmother say to one another, Those are the tears which the herd boy and the weaving maiden shed at parting. And for this reason, the seventh day is a rain festival. To the west of the Silver River is the constellation of the weaving maiden, consisting of three stars, and directly in front of it are three other stars in the form of a triangle. It is said that once the herd boy was angry because the weaving maiden had not wished to cross the Silver River and had thrown his yoke at her, which fell down just in front of her feet. East of the Silver River is the herd boy's constellation consisting of six stars. To one side of it are countless little stars which form a constellation pointed at both ends and somewhat broader in the middle. It is said that the weaving maiden in turn threw her spindle at the herd boy, but that she did not hit him, the spindle falling down to one side of him. End of chapter 8「Chapter 4 of Coca Break Collection, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ratandeep Satwant Singh. Coca Break Collection, Volume 2. By Various. The Jellyfish Takes a Journey. By Grace James. Once upon a time, the jellyfish was a very handsome fellow. His form was beautiful and round as a full moon. He had glittering scales and fins and a tail as other fishes have. But he had more than these. He had little feet as well, so that he could walk upon the land as well as swim in the sea. He was merry and he was gay. He was beloved and trusted of the Dragon King. In spite of all this, his grandmother always said that he would come to a bad end, because he would not mind his books at school. She was right. It all came about in this wise. The Dragon King was but lately wed when the young lady dragon, his wife, fell very sick. She took to her bed and stayed there and wise folk in dragonland shook their heads and said her last day was at hand doctors came from far and near and they dosed her and they bled her but no good at all could they do her the poor young thing nor recover her of her sickness the dragon king was beside himself heart's desire he said to his pale bride i would give my life for you little good would it do to me she answered howbeit if you will fetch me a monkey's liver i will eat it and live a monkey's liver cried the dragon king a monkey's liver you talk wildly o light of mine eyes how shall i find a monkey's liver Know you not, sweet one, that monkeys dwell in the trees of the forest whilst we are in the deep sea? Tears ran down the dragon queen's lovely countenance. If I do not have the monkey's liver, I shall die, she said. Then the dragon went forth and called to him the jellyfish. The queen must have a monkey's liver, he said, to cure her of her sickness. What will she do with the monkey's liver? asked the jellyfish. Why, she will eat it, 
said the Dragon King. Oh, said the jellyfish. Now, said the king, you must go and fetch me a live monkey. I have heard that they dwell in the tall trees of the forest. Therefore swim quickly, O oh jellyfish, and bring a monkey with you back again. How will I get the monkey to come back with me? said the jellyfish. Tell him of all the beauties and pleasures of Dragonland. Tell him he will be happy here and that he may play with mermaids all the day long. Well, said the jellyfish, I will tell him that. Off said the jellyfish, and he swam and he swam, till at last he reached the shore where grew the tall trees of the forest, and sure enough there was a monkey sitting in the branches of a persimmon tree, eating persimmons. The very thing, said the jellyfish to himself, I am in luck. Noble monkey, he said, will you come to Dragonland with me? How should I get there? said the monkey. Only sit on my back, said the jellyfish, and I will take you there. You will have no trouble at all. Why should I go there after all, said the monkey. I am very well off as I am. Ah, said the jellyfish. It's plain that you know little of all the beauties and pleasures of Dragonland. There you will be happy as the day is long. You will win great riches and honor. Besides, you may play with the mermaid from morn till eve. I will come, said the monkey. And he slipped down from the persimmon tree and jumped on the jellyfish's back. When the two of them were about halfway over to Dragonland, the jellyfish laughed. Now, jellyfish, why do you laugh? I laugh for joy, said the jellyfish. When you come to Dragonland, my master, the Dragon King, will get your liver and give it to my mistress, the Dragon Queen, to eat, and then she will recover from her sickness. My liver? said the monkey. Why, of course, said the jellyfish. Alas and alack, cried the monkey, I am grieved indeed, but if it's my liver you are wanting, I haven't it with me. To tell you the truth, it weighs pretty heavy. So I just took it out and hung it up a branch of that permission tree where you found me. Quick, quick, let's go back for it. Back they went, and the monkey was up in the persimmon tree in a twinkling. Mercy me! I don't see it at all, he said. Where can I have mislaid it? I should not be surprised if some rascal has stolen it, he said. Now if the jellyfish had minded his books at school, would he have been hoodwinked by the monkey? You may believe not, but his grandmother always said he would come to a bad end. I shall be some time finding it, said the monkey. You would best be getting home to Dragonland. The king would be loath for you to be out after dark. You can call for me another day. Sayonara! The monkey and the jellyfish parted on the best of terms. The minute the dragon king set eyes on the jellyfish, Where's the monkey? he said. I am to call for him another day, said the jellyfish, and he told all the tale. The dragon king flew into a towering rage. He called his executioners and bid them beat the jellyfish. Break every bone in his body, he cried. Beat him to a jelly. Alas for the sad fate of the jellyfish. Jelly he remains to this very day. As for the young dragon queen, she was fain to laugh when she heard the story. If I can't have a monkey's liver, I must needs do without it, she said. Give me my best brocade gown and I will get up, for I feel a good deal better. End of chapter 4 The Jellyfish Takes a Journey Chapter 6 of Cocoa Break Collection, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Nelson
Cocoa Break Collection, Volume 2, by Various, from East of the Sun and West of the Moon, by Peter Kristen S. Bjornsson and Jorgen Engelbretsen Moe. Chapter 6. The Lad Who Went to the North Wind Once on a time there was an old widow who had one son, and as she was poorly and weak, her son had to go up into the safe to fetch meal for cooking. But when he got outside the safe and was just going down the steps, there came the north wind, puffing and blowing, caught up the meal, and so away with it through the air. Then the lad went back into the safe for more. But when he came out again on the steps, if the north wind didn't come again and carry off the meal with a puff. And, more than that, he did so the third time. At this the lad got very angry, and as he thought it hard that the north wind should behave so, he thought he'd just look him up and ask him to give up his meal. So off he went, but the way was long, and he walked and walked. But at last he came to the north wind's house. Good day, said the lad, and thank you for coming to see us yesterday. Good day, answered the north wind, for his voice was loud and gruff. And thanks for coming to see me. What do you want? Oh, answered the lad, I only wish to ask you to be so good as to let me have back that meal you took from me on the safe steps, for we haven't much to live on. And if you're to go on snapping up the morsel we have, there'll be nothing for it but to starve. I haven't got your meal, said the north wind. But if you are in such need, I'll give you a cloth which will get you everything you want. If you only say, cloth, spread yourself, and serve up all kinds of good dishes. With this, the lad was well content. But as the way was so long, he couldn't get home in one day, so he turned into an inn on the way. And when they were going to sit down to supper, he laid the cloth on a table which stood in the corner and said, Cloth, spread yourself, and serve up all kinds of good dishes. He had scarce said so before the cloth did as it was bid, and all who stood by thought it a fine thing, but most of all the landlady. So when all were fast asleep at dead of night, she took the lad's cloth and put another in its stead, just like the one he had got from the north wind, but which couldn't so much as serve up a bit of dry bread. So when the lad woke, he took his cloth and went off with it, and that day he got home to his mother. Now, said he, I've been to the north wind's house, and a good fellow he is, for he gave me this cloth. And when I only say to it, cloth, spread yourself, and serve up all kinds of good dishes, I get any sort of food I please. All very true, I dare say, said his mother. But seeing is believing, and I shan't believe it till I see it. So the lad made haste, drew out a table, laid the cloth on it, and said, Cloth, spread yourself, and serve up all kinds of good dishes but never a bit of dry bread did the cloth serve up. Well, said the lad, there's no help for it but to go to the north wind again, and away he went. So he came to where the north wind lived late in the afternoon. Good evening, said the lad. Good evening, said the north wind. I want my rights for that meal of ours which you took, said the lad, for as for that cloth I got, it isn't worth a penny. I've got no meal, said the north wind, but yonder you have a ram which coins nothing but golden ducats as soon as you say to it, ram, ram, make money. So the lad thought this a fine thing, but as it was too far to get home that day, he turned in for the night to the same inn where he had slept before. Before he called for anything, he tried the truth of what the north wind had said of the ram and found it all right. But when the landlord saw that, he thought it was a famous ram, and when the lad had fallen asleep, he took another which couldn't coin gold ducats and changed the two. Next morning, off went the lad, and when he got home to his mother, he said, After all, 
The north wind is a jolly fellow, for now he has given me a ram which can coin golden ducats, if only I say, Ram, ram, make money. All very true, I dare say, said his mother, but I shan't believe any such stuff until I see the ducats made. Ram, ram, make money, said the lad, but if the ram made anything, it wasn't money. So the lad went back again to the north wind, and blew him up, and said the ram was worth nothing, and he must have his rights for the meal. Well, said the north wind, I've nothing else to give you but that old stick in the corner yonder, but it's a stick of that kind that if you say, stick, stick, lay on, it lays on till you say, stick, stick, now stop. So, as the way was long, the lad turned in this night, too, to the landlord. But as he could pretty well guess how things stood as to the cloth and the ram, he lay down at once on the bench and began to snore, as if he were asleep. Now the landlord, who easily saw that the stick must be worth something, hunted up one which was like it, and when he heard the lad snore, was going to change the two. But just as the landlord was about to take it, the lad bawled out, Stick, stick, lay on. So the stick began to beat the landlord, till he jumped over chairs, and tables, and benches, and yelled and roared, Oh my, oh my, bid the stick be still, else it will beat me to death, and you shall have back both your cloth and your ram. When the lad thought the landlord had had enough, he said, Stick, stick, now stop. Then he took the cloth and put it into his pocket, and went home with his stick in his hand, leading the ram by a cord round its horns, and so he got his rights for the meal he had lost. End of chapter 6 Recording by Mike Nelson Linda Branca and Her Mask by Elsie Spicer Eels. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Linda Branca and Her Mask by Elsie Spicer Eels. The story of the girl who did not like to be pretty. Long ago, there lived a girl who was so pretty, she grew tired of being beautiful and longed to be ugly. She was so attractive that all the young men in the whole city wanted to marry her. Every night, the street in front of her house was full of youths who came to sing beneath her balcony. Linda Branca, that was the girl's name, grew tired of being kept awake nights. It is well enough for a little while to hear songs about one's pearly teeth and snowy arms, one's flashing eyes and waving hair, one's rosebud mouth and fairy-like feet, but a steady diet of it becomes decidedly wearing. I wish I were as homely as that girl who was passing by, she remarked one day. Then I could sleep nights. If I were as ugly-looking as that, I'd have a chance to select a really good husband, perhaps. With so many to choose from, it's terribly confusing. I'll never be able to make any choice at all, as things are now. I'm afraid I'll die unwedded, she added, as she carefully surveyed the girl's coarse hair, her large feet and hands, her ugly big mouth and ears and small red-lidded eyes. That girl has a much better chance of a successful marriage than I have, with all this tiresome crowd of suitors to drive me distracted. The girl in the street heard her words and looked up. When she saw how lovely Linda Branca was, she was amazed indeed at the words she had heard. She thought that she must have made a mistake and asked Linda Branca to say it all over again. You can be exactly as homely as I am, declared the girl, when at last she had sufficiently recovered from her surprise to find her tongue. 
I am an artist. I can prepare a mask for you, which will make you just as ugly as I am. Go on, and make it as soon as you can, cried Linda Branca, clapping her little hands in joy. That evening, the suitors in the street, under the balcony, thought that the lovely Linda Branca had become very gracious. She was frequently to be seen on the balcony looking eagerly up and down the street as if she were expecting someone. Her dark eyes were sparkling, and her fair cheek had a rosy flush upon it, which they had never seen before. The beautiful Linda Branca is more charming than ever, was the burden of their songs that night. Linda Branca was so excited about her new mask that she could not have slept even if there had been no suitors to disturb her with their songs. When at last she fell asleep towards morning, it was only to dream that the new mask had the face of a donkey. It was not until the next week that the mask finally arrived. Linda Branca had grown very impatient and was almost in despair, lest she should never receive it. When at last the girl brought it, one could easily see why it had taken a whole week to prepare it. So like a human face it was, that it was plain that the making of it had called forth great patience and skill, as well as necessary time. It is even uglier than I had hoped it would be, cried Linda Branca, in delight when she saw it. Surely, when she tried it on, no one of her suitors would ever have recognized the fair Linda Branca of their songs. Now, Linda Branca had no mother, and her father was away on business, so it was an easy matter to prepare for her departure. Linda Branca's father was a man of wealth who spared no money in giving his daughter beautiful gowns to enhance her rare beauty. She had one dress of blue trimmed with silver, and another of blue embroidered in gold. As she packed up a few belongings to take with her, she decided to add these two favorite garments. Who knows, but I may need them some time, she mused as she rolled them up carefully. With the ugly mask upon her face and dressed in a long, dark cloak, she quietly stole out of the house. She went to the king's palace in the neighboring city and inquired if they were in need of a maid. Ask my son, it is he who rules here, said the king's mother. The king looked at Linda Branca with a critical eye. I hired my last servant because she was so pretty, he remarked. I think I'll hire this one because she is so ugly. Accordingly, Linda Branca became a servant in the royal palace. She soon discovered, however, that it was the pretty maid who received all the favors. It was good to sleep nights without being disturbed by the songs of suitors under her window. Nevertheless, after a time, Linda Branca could not fail to see that it was the pretty maid who had the happy life. I believe I'd almost be willing to be pretty again, said Linda Branca to herself. Perhaps it has some advantages. She knew very well that the pretty maid was not as tired as she that night. The next day there was to be a great feast, which was to last for two days. Linda Branca asked the queen if she might be allowed to attend. Ask my son, said the queen. It is he who rules here. May I go to the feast? asked Linda Branca when she was blacking the king's boots. Look out, or I'll throw my boot at you, said the king. That night, when the feast had already begun, she dressed herself carefully in the robe of blue trimmed with silver. It was indeed a pleasure to remove the ugly mask and find that she was still just as lovely as when the crowds of suitors sang about her great beauty. That night at the feast, everyone talked about the beauty of the mysterious stranger in the dress of blue trimmed with silver. The king himself danced with her. He was completely captivated by her charm. "'Where do you come from, lovely lady?' he asked. "'I come from the land of the boot,' replied Linda Branca, with a gay laugh. The king was completely mystified, for he did not know where the land of the boot was. 
he asked the queen and all the wise men of the court but there was not a single one of them who had ever heard of that country the next day they hunted through all the books and all the maps but there was no book or map which mentioned it she is the most beautiful maiden i have ever seen cried the king i'd like to marry her but how can i ever see her again if i can't find out the location of the land she comes from he was in deep despair and every one in the royal palace was nearly distracted it was decidedly embarrassing to have the king fall in love with a stranger from a country nobody could find on a map or in a book when the king returned from the feast he saw the ugly little maid he had hired busy at her work about the palace the next day she again asked the queen's permission to go to the feast that night ask my son was the queen's reply when linda branca asked the king's permission he replied look out or i'll hit you with my hairbrush that night linda branca again removed her ugly mask and dressed herself in the beautiful gown of blue embroidered in gold she was even lovelier than the night before when she entered the grand ballroom the king was almost wild with joy he ran to her side at once and kept dancing with her the entire evening what country do you come from he asked again i'm from the land of the hairbrush replied linda branca where is that land asked the king but linda branca would not tell him where is the land of the hairbrush asked the king of the queen mother and of all the wise men of the court nobody could tell him and nobody could find the land of the hairbrush upon any map or in any book stupid ones cried the king i don't believe you have half tried to find it he looked through all the maps and books himself and at last he grew ill from so much studying his friends all gathered about him in the royal bedchamber and sought to console him however he refused consolation i do not care whether i live or die he cried i care for nothing except the beautiful stranger who came to my feast linda branca knew that the king was ill and when these words were reported to her she quickly dressed herself in the robe of blue trimmed with silver which she had worn the first night of the feast when she took off her ugly mask and looked at herself in the glass she was really pleased with her reflection it is not so bad after all to be pretty she said as she smiled linda branca stole out of the palace and peeped into the window of the royal bedchamber one of the king's counsellors saw her whose lovely face is that at the window he asked it is surely the beautiful stranger from the land of the boot said one it is the charming maiden from the land of the hairbrush disputed another by the time the king himself had reached the window there was no one to be seen he called for the queen his mother tell me mother who was outside my window a moment ago he asked no one unless a masquerader replied the queen the poor queen was nearly worn out with worry over her son she was afraid he was so sick that he was going to die the next day the king had in truth grown most decidedly worse the court physicians went about with anxious faces and the whole palace had become a place of deepest gloom linda branca put on her dress of blue embroidered with gold and again peeped into the window of the royal bedchamber now the king had lain upon his richly carved bed with his eyes fixed every moment upon the window where the face had appeared he did not close his eyes at all he can't live long if this keeps up one court physician whispered to another he had just finished saying these words when the king gave a loud cry and sprang from his bed he ran to the window and reached it just in time to catch a piece of the skirt of blue embroidered in gold he held it tight masquerader unmask he cried linda branca had hastily put on the mask which she had brought with her 
and now she looked up at the king with the face of the little servant he had hired. She took off the mask and smiled into his eyes. Now at last I know who is the beautiful stranger from the land of the boot and the land of the hairbrush, cried the king. When Linda Branca had told the king, the queen mother, and all the courtiers her whole story, everybody laughed. Who ever before heard of a maiden who wanted to be less beautiful than nature had made her, cried the wise men. I always knew that when my son saw fit to select his bride, he would choose a rare woman, said the queen mother proudly. The king himself did not say a single word, but gazed and gazed at the lovely face of Linda Branca, with such joy in his eyes that she knew in her heart that at last she was glad to be beautiful. Stay pretty is a parting greeting between women in the Azores. Perhaps it was Linda Branca herself who began saying it in the beginning. End of Linda Branca and Her Mask by Elsie Spicer Eels Chapter 13 of Cocoa Break Collection, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Raybright. Cocoa Break Collection, Volume 2 by Various. Chapter 13. The Little Purse with Two Half Pennies. By R. J. Krenga. There once was an old man and an old woman. The old woman had a hen, and the old man had a rooster. The old woman's hen laid two eggs a day, and she ate a great many. But she would not give the old man a single one. One day the old man lost patience and said, Listen, old crony, you live as if you were in clover. Give me a couple eggs so that I can at least have the taste of them. No, indeed, replied the old woman, who was very avaricious. If you want eggs, beat your rooster, that he may lay eggs for you, and then eat them. I flogged my hen, and just see how she lays now. The old man, being stingy and greedy, listened to the old woman's talk, angrily ceased the rooster, gave him a sound thrashing, and said, There now, lay some eggs for me, or else go out of the house. I won't feed you for nothing any longer. As soon as the rooster escaped from the old man's hands, it ran off down the high road. While thus pursuing its way, lo and behold, it found a little purse with two half pennies. Taking it in his beak, the bird turned and went back toward the old man's house. On the road it met a carriage containing a gentleman and several ladies. The gentleman looked at the rooster, saw a purse in its bill, and said to the driver, Get down and see what this rooster has in his beak. The driver hastily jumped from his box, took the little purse from the rooster's bill, and gave it to his master. The gentleman put it in his pocket and drove on. The rooster was very angry and ran after the carriage, repeating continually, Kikiri key, sir, kikiri cack, to me the little purse give back. The enraged gentleman said to the coachman as they passed the well, Take that impudent rooster and throw it into the well. The driver got down from his box again, seized the rooster, and flung it down into the well. When the rooster saw that its life was in such a great danger, what was it to do? It began to swallow the water and drank and drank, till it had swallowed all the water in the well. Then it flew out and again ran after the carriage, calling, Kikiri key, sir, kikiri cack, to me the little purse, give it back. When the gentleman saw this, he was perfectly amazed and said, Ho, ho, this rooster is a perfect imp of Satan. Never mind, I'll wring your neck, you saucy cockerel. When he reached home, he told the cook to take the rooster, throw it on the coals burning upon the hearth, push a big stone in front of the opening in the chimney. The old woman did what her master bade her. 
When the rooster saw this new injustice, it began to spit out the water it had swallowed till it had poured all the water from the well upon the burning coals. This put out the fire, cooled the hearth, and made such a flood in the, on the kitchen floor that the cook fainted away from pure rage. Then the rooster gave the stone a push, came out safe and sound, ran to the gentleman's window, and began to knock on the panes with its bell screaming, Kikiri key, sir, kikiri cack, to me the little purse give back. Heaven knows that I've got a torment in this monster of a rooster, said the gentleman. Driver, rid me of it. Toss it in the middle of the herds of cows and oxen. Perhaps some bull will stick its horns through it and relieve us. The coachman seized the rooster and flung it among the herds. You ought to have seen the rooster's delight. It swallowed bulls and oxen and cows and calves until it had devoured the whole herd and its stomach had grown as big as a mountain. Then it went to the window again, spread out its wings before the sun so that it darkened the gentleman's room, and once more began, Kikiriki, sir, kikirikak, to me the little purse give back. When the gentleman saw this, he was ready to burst with rage and did not know what to do to get rid of the rooster. He stood thinking till at last an idea entered his head. I'll lock it up in the treasure chamber. Perhaps if it tries to swallow the ducats, one of them will stick in his throat, and I shall be get rid of this bird. No sooner said than done. He grasped the rooster and flung it into the treasure chamber. The rooster swallowed all the money and left the chest empty. Then it escaped from the room, went to the gentleman's window, and again began. Kikiriki, sir, kikiri-cack, to me the little purse give back. As the gentleman saw that there was nothing else to be done, he tossed the purse out. The rooster picked it up, went about its own business, and left the gentleman in peace. All the poultry ran after the rooster, so that it really looked like a wedding. But the gentleman turned green with rage as he watched and said, sighing, let them all run off to the last chick. I'm glad to be rid of this torment. There was witchcraft in that rooster. But the puffed-up rooster stalked proudly along, followed by all the fowls, and went merrily on and on till he reached the old man's house and began to crow, Kikriki! When the old man heard the rooster's voice, he ran out joyfully to meet the bird. But looking through the door, what did he see? This rooster had become a terrible object. An elephant beside it would have seemed like a flea. And following behind came countless flocks of birds, each one more beautiful and brilliant than the other. When the old man saw the rooster so huge and fat, he opened the gate for it. Master, said the bird, spread a sheet here in the middle of the yard. The old man, as nimble as a top, laid down the sheet. The rooster took its stand upon it, spread his wings, and instantly the whole yard was filled with birds and herds of cattle. But it shook out on the sheet a pile of ducats that flashed in the sun till they dazzled the eyes. When the old man beheld this vast treasure, he did not know what to do in his delight, and hugged and kissed the rooster. But all at once the old woman appeared from somewhere, and when she saw this marvelous spectacle, her eyes glittered in her head, and she was ready to burst with wrath. Dear old friend, she said, give me a few ducats. Pine away with longing for them, old woman, when I begged you for some eggs, you know what you answered. Now flog your hen that it may bring you ducats. I beat my rooster, and you see what it fetched me. The old woman went to the hen coop shook the hen, took it by the tail, and gave it such a drubbing that it was enough to make one weep for pity. When the poor hen escaped from the old woman's hands, it fled to the highway. While walking along, it found a bead, swallowed it, and hurried back home as fast as possible, and began to cackle at the gate. The old woman welcomed it joyfully. The hen ran quickly in at the gate, passed its mistress, and went to its nest. At the end of an hour it jumped off, cackling loudly. The old woman hastened to see what the hen had laid. 
But when she glanced into the nest, what did she perceive? A little glass bead. The hen had laid a glass bead. When the old woman saw that the hen had fooled her, she began to beat it and beat it till she flogged it to death. So the stupid old soul remained as poor as a church mouse. From that time she might live on roast nothing and golden wait a while instead of eggs, for she had abused and killed the poor hen, though it was not at all to blame. But the old man was very rich. He built great houses, laid out beautiful gardens, and lived luxuriously. He made the old woman his poultry maid, the rooster he took about with him everywhere dressed in a gold collar, yellow boots, and spurs on its heels, so that one might have thought it was one of the three kings from the Christmas play, instead of a merry, ordinary rooster. End of chapter 13all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Verity Kendall. Coco Break Collection, Volume 2, by Various. The Old Woman and Her Pig, by Thora Annie Steele. An old woman was sweeping her house, and she found a little crooked sixpence. What, said she, shall I do with this little sixpence? I will go to market and buy a little pig. So she bought a little pig, but as she was coming home, she came to a stile, and the piggy would not go over the stile. She went a little further and met a dog. So she said to him, Dog, dog, bite pig. Piggy won't go over the stile, and I shan't get home till midnight. But the dog wouldn't. She went a little further, and she met a stick. So she said, Stick, stick, beat dog. Dog won't bite pig, piggy won't go over the stile, and I shan't get home till midnight. But the stick wouldn't. She went a little further, and she met a fire. So she said, Fire, fire, burn stick. Stick won't beat dog, dog won't bite pig, pig won't get over the stile, and I shan't get home till midnight. But the fire wouldn't. So she went a little further, and she met some water. So she said, Water, water, quench fire. Fire won't burn stick, stick won't beat dog, dog won't bite pig, pig won't get over the stile, and I shan't get home till midnight. But the water wouldn't. She went a little further, and she met an ox. So she said, Ox, ox, drink water, water won't quench fire, fire won't burn stick, stick won't beat dog, dog won't bite pig, pig won't get over the stile, and I shan't get home till midnight. But the ox wouldn't. She went a little further, and she met a butcher. So she said, Butcher, butcher, kill ox. Ox won't drink water. Water won't quench fire. Fire won't burn stick. Stick won't beat dog. Dog won't bite pig. Pig won't get over the stile, and I shan't get home till midnight. But the butcher wouldn't. She went a little further, and she met a rope. So she said, Rope, rope, hang butcher. Butcher won't kill ox. Ox won't drink water. Water won't quench fire, fire won't burn stick, stick won't beat dog, dog won't bite pig, pig won't get over the stile, and I shan't get home till midnight. But the rope wouldn't. She went a little further, and she met a rat. So she said, rat, rat, nor rope, rope won't hang butcher, butcher won't kill ox, ox won't drink water, water won't quench fire, fire won't burn stick, stick won't beat dog, dog won't bite pig, pig won't get over the stile and I shan't get home till midnight. But the rat wouldn't. She went a little further, and she met a cat. So she said, Cat, cat, kill rat. Rat won't gnaw rope. Rope won't hang butcher. Butcher won't kill ox. Ox won't drink water. Water won't quench fire. Fire won't burn stick. Stick won't beat dog. Dog won't bite pig. Pig won't get over the stile, and I shan't get home till midnight. But the cat said to her, if you will go to yonder cow and fetch me a saucer of milk, I will kill the rat. So away went the woman to the cow. But the cow said to her, If you will go to yonder haystack and fetch me a handful of hay, I will give you the milk. So away went the old woman to the haystack, and she brought the hay to the cow. 
As soon as the cow had eaten the hay, she gave the old woman the milk, and away she went with it in a saucer to the cat. As soon as the cat had lapped up the milk, the cat began to kill the rat, the rat began to gnaw the rope, the rope began to hang the butcher, the butcher began to kill the ox, the ox began to drink the water, the water began to quench the fire, the fire began to burn the stick, the stick began to beat the dog, the dog began to bite the pig, the little pig squealed and jumped over the stile, and so the old woman got home before midnight. End of the Old Woman and Her Pig Recording by Verity Kendall Chapter 11 of Cocoa Break Collection, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jacob Payne. Cocoa Break Collection, Volume 2, by Various. Spirits of the Yellow River. Translated by Frederick H. Martins. The spirits of the Yellow River are called Daiwang, Great King. For many hundreds of years past, the river inspectors had continued to report that all sorts of monsters show themselves in the waves of the stream, at times in the shape of dragons, at others in that of cattle and horses, and whenever such a creature makes an appearance, a great flood follows. Hence, temples are built along the river banks. The higher spirits of the river are honored as kings, the lower ones as captains, and hardly a day goes by without their being honored with sacrifices or theatrical performances. Whenever, after a dam has been broken, the leak is closed again, the emperor sends officials with sacrifices and ten great bars of Tibetan incense. This incense is burned in the great sacrificial censer in the temple court, and the river inspectors and their subordinates all go to the temple to thank the gods for their aid. These river gods, it is said, are good and faithful servants of the former rulers, who died in consequence of their toil in keeping the dams unbroken. After they died, their spirits became river kings. In their physical bodies, however, they appear as lizards, snakes, and frogs. The mightiest of all the river kings is the Golden Dragon King. He frequently appears in the shape of a small golden snake, with a square head, low forehead, and four red dots over his eyes. He can make himself large or small at will, and cause the waters to rise and fall. He appears and vanishes unexpectedly, and lives in the mouths of the Yellow River and the Imperial Canal. But in addition to the Golden Dragon King, there are dozens of river kings and captains, each of whom has his own place. The sailors of the Yellow River all have exact lists in which the lives and deeds of the river spirits are described in detail. The river spirits love to see theatrical performances. Opposite every temple is a stage. In the hall stands the little spirit tablet of the River King, and on the altar in front of it a small bowl of golden lacquer filled with clean sand. When a little snake appears in it, the River King has arrived. Then the priests strike the gong and beat the drum and read from the holy books. The official is at once informed, and he sends for a company of actors. Before they begin to perform, the actors go up to the temple, kneel, and beg the king to let them know which play they are to give. And the river god picks one out and points to it with his head, or else he writes signs in the sand with his tail. The actors then at once begin to perform the desired play. The river god cares not for the fortunes or misfortunes of human beings. He appears suddenly and disappears in the same way as best suits him. Between the outer and the inner dam of the Yellow River are a number of settlements. Now it often happens that the yellow water moves to the very edge of the inner walls, rising perpendicularly like a wall. It gradually advances. When people see it coming, they hastily burn incense, bow in prayer before the waters, and promise the river god a theatrical performance. Then the water retires, and the word goes round, the river god has asked for a play again. In a village in that section, there once dwelt a wealthy man. He built a stone wall, twenty feet high, around the village, to keep away the water. He did not believe in the spirits of the river, but trusted in his strong wall and was quite unconcerned. One evening, the yellow water suddenly rose and towered in a straight line before the village. The rich man had them shoot cannon at it. Then the water grew stormy and surrounded the wall to such a height that it reached the openings in the battlements. The water foamed and hissed and seemed about to pour over the wall. Then everyone in the village was very much frightened. They dragged up the rich man, and he had to kneel and beg for pardon. 
They promised the river god a theatrical performance, but in vain. But when they promised to build him a temple in the middle of the village and give regular performances, the water sank more and more and gradually returned to its bed, and the village fields suffered no damage, for the earth, fertilized by the yellow slime, yielded a double crop. Once a scholar was crossing the fields with a friend in order to visit a relative. On their way, they passed a temple of the river god where a new play was just being performed. The friend asked the scholar to go in with him and look on. When they entered the temple court, they saw two great snakes upon the front pillars who had wound themselves about the columns and were thrusting out their heads as though watching the performance. In the hall of the temple stood the altar with a bowl of sand. In it lay a small snake with a golden body, a green head, and red dots above his eyes. His neck was thrust up, and his glittering little eyes never left the stage. The friend bowed, and the scholar followed his example. Softly he said to his friend, What are the three river gods called? The one in the temple, was the reply, is the golden dragon king. The two on the columns are two captains. They do not dare to sit in the temple together with the king. This surprised the scholar, and in his heart he thought, Such a tiny snake! How can it possess a god's power? It would have to show me its might before I would worship it. He had not yet expressed these secret thoughts before the little snake suddenly stretched forth his head from the bowl above the altar. Before the altar burned two enormous candles. They weighed more than ten pounds and were as thick as small trees. Their flame burned like the flare of a torch. The snake now thrust his head into the middle of the candle flame. The flame must have been at least an inch broad and was burning red. Suddenly its radiance turned blue and was split into two tongues. The candle was so enormous and its fire so hot that even copper and iron would have melted in it, but it did not harm the snake. Then the snake crawled into the censer. The censer was made of iron and was so large one could not clasp it with both arms. Its cover showed a dragon design in open work. The snake crawled in and out of the holes in this cover and wound his way through all of them so that he looked like an embroidery in threads of gold. Finally, all the openings of the cover, large and small, were filled by the snake. In order to do so, he must have made himself several dozen feet long. Then he stretched out his head at the top of the censer and once more watched the play. Thereupon the scholar was frightened. He bowed twice and prayed, Great king, you have taken this trouble on my account. I honor you from my heart. No sooner had he spoken these words than, in a moment, the little snake was back in his bowl and just as small as he had been before. In Xin Ying Chou, they were celebrating the river god's birthday in his temple. They were giving him a theatrical performance for a birthday present. The spectators crowded around as thick as a wall, when who should pass but a simple peasant from the country, who said in a loud voice, Why, that is nothing but a tiny worm! It is a great piece of folly to honor it like a king. Before ever he had finished speaking, the snake flew out of the temple. He grew and grew and wound himself three times around the stage. He became as thick around as a small pail, and his head seemed like that of a dragon. His eyes sparkled like golden lamps, and he spat out red flame with his tongue. When he coiled and uncoiled, the whole stage trembled, and it seemed as though it would break. The actors stopped their music and fell down on the stage in prayer. The whole multitude was seized with terror and bowed to the ground. Then some of the old men came along, cast the peasant on the ground, and gave him a good thrashing. So he had to cast himself on his knees before the snake and worship him. Then all heard a noise as though a great many firecrackers were being shot off. This lasted for some time, and then the snake disappeared. East of Shandong lies the city of Dongshou. There rises an observation tower with a great temple. At its feet lies the water city with a sea gate at the north, through which the flood tide rises up to the city. A camp of the boundary guard is established at this gate. Once upon a time there was an officer who had been transferred to this camp as captain. He had formerly belonged to the land forces, and had not yet been long at his new post. He gave some friends of his a banquet, and before the pavilion in which they feasted lay a great stone shaped somewhat like a table. Suddenly a little snake was seen crawling on this stone. It was spotted with green and had red dots on its square head. The soldiers were about to kill the little creature when the captain went out to look into the matter. When he had looked, he laughed and said, You must not harm him! He is the river king of Xinying Chou. When I was stationed in Xinying Chou, he sometimes visited me, and then I always gave sacrifices and performances in his honor. Now he has come here expressly in order to wish his old friend luck and to see him once more. 
there was a band in camp. The bandsmen could dance and play like a real theatrical troupe. The captain quickly had them begin a performance, had another banquet with wine and delicate foods prepared, and invited the river god to sit down to the table. Gradually, evening came, and yet the river god made no move to go. So the captain stepped up to him with a bow and said, Here we are far removed from the Yellow River, and these people have never yet heard your name spoken. Your visit has been a great honor for me, but the women and fools who have crowded together chattering outside are afraid of hearing about you. Now you have visited your old friend, and I am sure you wish to get back home again. With these words, he had a litter brought up, symbols were beaten and fireworks set off, and finally a salute of nine guns was fired to escort him on his way. Then the little snake crawled into the litter, and the captain followed after. In this order they reached the port, and just when it was about time to say farewell, the snake was already swimming in the water. He had grown much larger, nodded to the captain with his head, and disappeared. Then there were doubts and questionings. But the river god lives a thousand miles away from here. How does he get to this place? said the captain. He is so powerful that he can get to any place. And besides, from where he dwells a waterway leads to the sea. Come down that way and swim to sea is something he can do in a moment's time. End of The Spirits of the Yellow River Translated by Frederick H. Martins Recording by Jacob Payne, Taipei, Taiwan Section 1 of Cocoa Break Collection, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Cocoa Break Collection, Volume 2 by Various. Rutabaga Stories by Carl Sandburg, 1878 to 1967. The story of Jason Squiff, and why he had a popcorn hat, popcorn mittens, and popcorn shoes. Jason Squiff was a cistern cleaner. He had greenish, yellowish hair. If you looked down into a cistern when he was lifting buckets of slush and mud, you could tell where he was. You could pick him out down in the dark cistern by the lights of his greenish, yellowish hair. Sometimes the buckets of slush and mud tipped over and ran down the top of his head. This covered his greenish-yellowish hair, and then it was hard to tell where he was, and it was not easy to pick him out, down in the dark, where he was cleaning the cistern. One day Jason Squiff came to the Bimber house and knocked on the door. "'Did I understand?' he said, speaking to Mrs. Bimber. Blixy Bimber's mother. Do I understand you sent for me to clean the cistern in your back yard? You understand exactly such, said Mrs. Bimber, and you are welcome as the flowers that bloom in the spring. Tra la la. Then I will go to work and clean the cistern. Tra la la, he answered, speaking to Mrs. Bimber. I'm the guy. Tra la la he said further, running his excellent fingers through his greenish-yellowish hair, which was shining brightly. He began cleaning the cistern. Blixie Bimber came out in the back yard. She looked down in the cistern. It was all dark. It looked like nothing but all dark down there. By and by she saw something greenish-yellowish. She watched it. Soon she saw it was Jason Squiff's head and hair, and then she knew the cistern was being cleaned, and Jason Squiff was on the job. So she sang, tra-la-la, and went back into the house and told her mother Jason Squiff was on the job. The last bucketful of slush and mud came at last for Jason Squiff. He squinted at the bottom. Something was shining. He reached his fingers down through the slush and mud and took out what was shining. It was the gold buckskin wincher Blixie Bimber lost from the gold chain around her neck the week before, when she was looking down into the cistern to see what she could see. It was exactly the same gold buckskin wincher shining and glittering like a sign of happiness. 
It's luck, said Jason Squiff, wiping his fingers on his greenish-yellowish hair. Then he put the gold buckskin wincher in his vest pocket and spoke to himself again. It's luck. A little after six o'clock that night, Jason Squiff stepped into his house and home and said hello to his wife and daughters. They all began to laugh. Their laughter was a ticklish laughter. Something funny is happening, he said. And you are it. They all laughed at him again with ticklish laughter. Then they showed him. His hat was popcorn, his mittens popcorn, and his shoes popcorn. He didn't know the gold buckskin wincher had a power and was working all the time. He didn't know the wincher in his vest pocket was saying, You have a letter Q in your name, and because you have the pleasure and happiness of having a Q in your name, you must have a popcorn hat, popcorn mittens, and popcorn shoes. The next morning he put on another hat, another pair of mittens, and another pair of shoes. And the minute he put them on, they changed to popcorn. So he tried on all his hats, mittens, and shoes. Always they changed to popcorn the minute he had them on. His hat was popcorn, his mittens popcorn, and his shoes popcorn. He went downtown to the stores. He bought a new hat, mittens, and shoes, and the minute he had them on, they changed to popcorn. So he decided he would go to work and clean cisterns with his popcorn hat, popcorn mittens, and popcorn shoes on. The people of the village of Cream Puffs enjoyed watching him walk up the street going to clean cisterns. People five and six blocks away could see him coming and going with his popcorn hat, popcorn mittens, and popcorn shoes. When he was down in a cistern, the children enjoyed looking down into the cistern to see him work. When none of the slush and mud fell on his hat and mittens, he was easy to find. The light of the shining popcorn lit up the whole inside of the cistern. Sometimes, of course, the white popcorn got full of black slush and black mud, and then, when Jason Squiff came up and walked home, he was not quite so dazzling to look at. It was a funny winter for Jason Squiff. It's a crime, a dirty crime, he said to himself. Now I can never be alone with my thoughts. Everybody looks at me when I go up the street. If I meet a funeral, even the pallbearers begin to laugh at my popcorn hat. If I meet people going to a wedding, they throw all the rice at me as if I am a bride and a groom all together. The horses try to eat my hat wherever I go. Three hats I have fed to horses this winter. And if I accidentally drop one of my mittens, the chickens eat it. Then Jason Squiff began to change. He became proud. I always wanted a white, beautiful hat like this white popcorn hat, he said to himself, and I always wanted white, beautiful mittens and white, beautiful shoes like these white popcorn mittens and shoes. When the boys yelled, Snowman, ya de da de da snowman, he just waved his hand to them with an upward gesture of his arm to show he was proud of how he looked. They all watch for me, he said to himself. I am distinguished, am I not? He asked himself. And he put his right hand into his left hand and shook hands with himself and said, You certainly look fixed up. One day he decided to throw away his vest. In the vest pocket was the gold buckskin wincher with the power working, the power saying, You have a letter Q in your name, and because you have the pleasure and happiness of having a Q in your name, you must have a popcorn hat, popcorn mittens, and popcorn shoes. Yes, he threw away the vest. He forgot all about the gold buckskin wincher being in the vest. 
he just handed the vest to a ragman, and the ragman put the vest with the gold buckskin wincher in a bag on his back and walked away. After that, Jason Squiff was like other people. His hats would never change to popcorn, nor his mittens to popcorn, nor his shoes to popcorn. And when anybody looked at him down in a cistern, cleaning the cistern, or when anybody saw him walking along the street, they knew him by his greenish, yellowish hair, which was always full of bright lights. And so, if you have a Q in your name, be careful if you ever come across a gold buckskin wincher. Remember, different winchers have different powers. End of the story of Jason Squiff and why he had a popcorn hat, popcorn mittens, and popcorn shoes. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Chapter 3 of Cocoa Break Collection, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Verity Kendall. Cocoa Break Collection, Volume 2. By Various. Chapter 3. The Three Little Pigs. By Flora Annie Steele. Once upon a time, there was an old sow who had three little pigs, and she had not enough for them to eat. And as she had not enough for them to eat, she said they had better go out into the world and seek their fortunes. Now the eldest pig went first and as he trotted along the road he met a man carrying a bundle of straw so he said very politely if you please sir could you give me that straw to build me a house and the man seeing what good manners the little pig had gave him the straw and the little pig set to work and built a beautiful house with it now when it was finished a wolf happened to pass that way and he saw the house and he smelt the pig inside so he knocked at the door and said little pig little pig let me in let me in but the little pig saw the wolf's big paws through the keyhole so he answered no 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 by the hair of my chinny chin chin then the wolf showed his teeth and said then i'll huff and i'll puff and i'll blow your house in so he huffed and he puffed and he blew the house in then he ate up the little piggy and went on his way now the next piggy when he started met a man carrying a bundle of furs and being very polite he said to him if you please sir could you give me that first to build me a house and the man seeing what good manners the little pig had gave him the first and the little pig set to work and built himself a beautiful house now it so happened that when the house was finished the wolf passed that way and he saw the house and he smelt the pig inside so he knocked at the door and said little pig little pig let me in let me in but the little pig peeped through the keyhole and saw the wolf's great ears so he answered back no 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 by the hair of my chinny chin chin then the wolf showed his teeth and said then i'll huff and i'll puff and i'll blow your house in so he huffed and he puffed and he blew the house in then he ate up little piggy and went on his way now the third little piggy when he started met a man carrying a load of bricks and being very polite he said if you please sir could you give me those bricks to build me a house and the man seeing that he had been well brought up gave him the bricks and the little pig set to work and built himself a beautiful house and once again it happened that when it was finished the wolf chanced to come that way and he saw the house and he smelt the pig inside so he knocked at the door and said little pig little pig let me in let me in but the little pig peeped through the keyhole and saw the wolf great eyes so he answered no 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 by the hair of my chinny chin chin then i'll huff and i'll puff and i'll blow your house in said the wolf showing his teeth well he huffed and he puffed he puffed and he huffed he huffed huffed and he puffed puffed but he could not blow the house down at last he was so out of breath that he couldn't huff and he couldn't puff any more so he thought a bit then he said little pig i know where there is ever such a nice field of turnips do you said little piggy where may that be i'll show you says the wolf if you'll be ready at six o'clock to-morrow morning i will pull round for you 
and we can go together to farmer smith's field and get turnips for dinner thank you kindly says the little pig i will be ready at six o'clock sharp but you see the little pig was not one to be taken in with chaff so he got up at five trotted off to farmer smith's field rooted up the turnips and was home eating them for breakfast when the wolf clattered at the door and cried little pig little pig aren't you ready ready says little piggy why what a sluggard you are i've been to the field and come back again and i'm having a nice pot full of turnips for breakfast then the wolf grew red with rage but he was determined to eat little piggy so he said as if he didn't care i'm glad you like them but i know of something better than turnips indeed says little piggy what may that be a little apple tree down in merry gardens with the juiciest sweetest apples on it so if you'll be ready at five o'clock tomorrow morning i will come round for you and we can get the apples together thank you kindly says little piggy i will be sure to be ready at five o'clock sharp now the next morning he bustled up ever so early and it was at four o'clock when he started to get the apples but you see the wolf had been taken in once and wasn't going to be taken in again so he also started at four o'clock and the little pig had but just got his basket half full of apples when he saw the wolf coming down the road licking his lips hello says the wolf here already you are an early bird are the apples nice very nice says little piggy i'll throw you down one to try and he threw it so far away that when the wolf had gone to pick it up the little pig was able to jump down with his basket and run home well the wolf was fair angry but he went next day to the little piggy's house and called through the door as mild as milk little pig little pig you are ever so clever i should like to give you a fairing so if you will come with me to the fair this afternoon you shall have one thank you kindly says little piggy what time shall we start at three o'clock sharp says the wolf so be sure to be ready i'll be ready before three sniggered the little piggy and he was he started early in the morning and went to the fair and rode in the swing and enjoyed himself ever so much and bought himself a butter churn as a fairing and trotted away towards home long before three o'clock but just as he got to the top of the hill what should he see but the wolf coming up all panting and red with rage well there was no place to hide but the butter churn so he crept into it and was just pulling down the cover when the churn started to roll down the hill bumpity bumpity bump of course piggy inside began to squeal and when the wolf heard the noise and saw the butter churn rolling down on top of him bumpity bumpity bump he was so frightened he turned tail and ran away but he was still determined to get the little pig for his dinner so he went next day to the house and told the pig how sorry he was not to have been able to keep his promise of going to the fair because of an awful dreadful terrible thing that had rushed at him making a fearsome noise dear me says the little piggy that must have been me i hid inside the butter churn when i saw you coming and it started to roll i'm sorry i frightened you but this was too much the wolf danced about with rage and swore he would come down the chimney and eat up the little pig for his supper but while he was climbing on to the roof the little pig made a blazing fire and put on a big pot full of water to boil then just as the wolf was coming down the chimney the little piggy off with the lid and plump in fell the wolf into the scalding water so the little piggy put the cover on again boiled the wolf up and ate him for supper End of chapter three recording by verity kendall chapter nine of cocoa break collection volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by samantha miles cocoa break collection volume two by various chapter nine rutabaga stories by carl sandberg the two skyscrapers who decided to have a child two skyscrapers stood across the street from each other in the village of liver and onions in the daylight when the streets poured full of people buying and selling 
These two skyscrapers talked with each other, the same as mountains talk. In the night time, when all the people buying and selling were gone home, and there were only policemen and taxicab drivers on the streets, in the night, when a mist crept up the streets and threw a purple and gray wrapper over everything, in the night, when the stars in the sky shook out sheets of purple and gray mist down over the town, then the two skyscrapers leaned toward each other and whispered. Whether they whispered secrets to each other, or whether they whispered simple things that you and I know and everybody knows, that is their secret. One thing is sure, they often were seen leaning toward each other and whispering in the night, the same as mountains lean and whisper in the night. High on the roof of one of the skyscrapers was a tin brass goat looking out across prairies, and silver blue lakes shining like blue porcelain breakfast plates, and out across silver snakes of winding rivers in the morning sun. And high on the roof of the other skyscraper was a tin brass goose, looking out across prairies and silver-blue lakes shining like blue porcelain breakfast plates and out across silver snakes of winding rivers in the morning sun. Now the northwest wind was a friend of the two skyscrapers, coming so far, coming five hundred miles in a few hours, coming so fast always while the skyscrapers were standing still, standing always on the same old street corners always, the northwest wind was a bringer of news. Well, I see the city is here yet, the northwest wind would whistle to the skyscrapers. And they would answer, Yes, and are the mountains standing yet, way out yonder where you come from, wind? Yes, the mountains are there yonder, and farther yonder is the sea, and the railroads are still going, still running across the prairie to the mountains to the sea the northwest wind would answer. And now there was a pledge made by the northwest wind to the two skyscrapers. Often the northwest wind shook the tin brass goat and shook the tin brass goose on top of the skyscrapers. Are you going to blow loose the tin brass goat on my roof? one asked. Are you going to blow loose the tin brass goose on my roof? the other asked. Oh, no! the northwest wind laughed first to one and then to the other. If I ever blow loose your tin brass goat, and if I ever blow loose your tin brass goose, it will be when I am sorry for you, because you are up against hard luck, and there is somebody's funeral. So time passed on, and the two skyscrapers stood with their feet among the policemen and the taxicabs, the people buying and selling, the customers with parcels, packages, and bundles, while away high on their roofs stood the goat and the goose, looking out on silver-blue lakes like blue porcelain breakfast plates and silver snakes of rivers winding in the morning sun. So time passed on, and the northwest wind kept coming, telling the news and making promises. So time passed on, and the two skyscrapers decided to have a child, and they decided when their child came it should be a free child. It must be a free child, they said to each other. It must not be a child standing still all its life on a street corner. Yes, if we have a child, she must be free to run across the prairie, to the mountains, to the sea. Yes, it must be a free child. So time passed on. Their child came. It was a railroad train, the Golden Spike Limited, the fastest long-distance train in the Rutabaga country. It ran across the prairie, to the mountains, to the sea. They were glad, the two skyscrapers were, glad to have a free child running away from the big city, far away to the mountains, far away to the sea, running as far as the farthest mountains and sea coasts touched by the northwest wind. They were glad their child was useful, the two skyscrapers were, glad, their child was carrying a thousand people a thousand miles a day, so when people spoke of the Golden Spike Limited, they spoke of it as a strong, lovely child. Then time passed on. There came a day when the newsies yelled as though they were crazy. Yah, yah, blah, blah, yo, yo, 
was what it sounded like to the two skyscrapers, who never bothered much about what the newsies were yelling. "'Ya, ya, blah, blah, yo, yo!' was the cry of the newsies that came up again to the tops of the skyscrapers. At last the yelling of the newsies came so strong the skyscrapers listened and heard the newsies yammering, "'All about the great train wreck! All about the Golden Spike disaster! Many lives lost! Many lives lost!' And the northwest wind came howling a slow, sad song. And late that afternoon a crowd of policemen, taxicab drivers, newsies, and customers with bundles all stood around talking and wondering about two things next to each other on the streetcar track in the middle of the street. One was a tin brass goat, the other was a tin brass goose, and they lay next to each other. End of chapter 9 Recording by Samantha Miles Chapter 12 of Cocoa Break Collection, Volume 2 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Coco Break Collection, Volume 2, by Various. Chapter 12. Why the Bananas Belong to the Monkey. A Story from Brazil, by Elsie Spicer Eels. Perhaps you do not know it, but the monkeys think that all the bananas belong to them. When Brazilian children eat bananas, they say, I am a monkey. I once knew a little boy in Brazil who was very, very fond of bananas. He always said, I am very much of a monkey. If you are fond of bananas, the Brazilian children would tell you that you are a monkey too. This is the story they tell to show us how it all came about. Once upon a time, when the world had just been made, and there was only one kind of banana, but very many kinds of monkeys, there was a little old woman who had a big garden full of banana trees. It was very difficult for the old woman to gather the bananas herself, so she made a bargain with the largest monkey. She told him that if he would gather the bunches of bananas for her, she would give him half of them. The monkey gathered the bananas. When he took his half, he gave the little old woman the bananas which grow at the bottom of the bunch, and are small and wrinkled. The nice, big, fat ones he kept for himself, and carried them home to let them ripen in the dark. The little old woman was very angry. She lay awake all night to think of some way by which she could get even with the monkey. At last she thought of a trick. The next morning she made an image of wax which looked just like a little black boy. Then she placed a large flat basket on the top of the image's head and in the basket she placed the best ripe bananas she could find. They certainly looked very tempting. After a little while the biggest monkey passed that way. He saw the image of wax and thought that it was a boy peddling bananas. He had often pushed over boy banana peddlers, upset their baskets, and then had run away with the bananas. This morning he was feeling very good-natured, so he thought he would first try asking politely for the bananas. "'Oh, peddler boy, peddler boy,' he said to him, "'please give me a banana.' The image of wax answered never a word." Again the monkey said, this time in a little louder voice, Oh, peddler boy, peddler boy, please give me a banana, just one little, ripe little, sweet little banana. The image of wax answered never a word. Then the monkey called out in his loudest voice, Oh, peddler boy, peddler boy, if you don't give me a banana, I'll give you such a push that it will upset all of your bananas. The image of wax was silent. The monkey ran towards the image of wax and struck it hard with his hand. His hand remained firmly embedded in the wax. Oh, peddler boy, peddler boy, let go my hand, the monkey called out. Let go my hand and give me a banana or else I'll give you a hard, hard blow with my other hand. 
the image of wax did not let go. The monkey gave the image a hard, hard blow with his other hand. The other hand remained firmly embedded in the wax. Then the monkey called out, Oh, peddler boy, peddler boy, let go my two hands. Let go my two hands and give me a banana, or else I will give you a kick with my foot. The image of wax did not let go. The monkey gave the image a kick with his foot, and his foot remained stuck fast in the wax. Oh, peddler boy, peddler boy, the monkey cried, let go my foot. Let go my two hands and my foot and give me a banana, or else I'll give you a kick with my other foot. The image of wax did not let go. Then the monkey, who was now very angry, gave the image of wax a kick with his foot, and his foot remained stuck fast in the wax. The monkey shouted, Oh, peddler boy, peddler boy, let go my foot. Let go my two feet and my two hands, and give me a banana, or else I'll give you a push with my body. The image of wax did not let go. The monkey gave the image of wax a push with his body. His body remained caught fast in the wax. Oh, peddler boy, peddler boy, the monkey shouted. Let go my body, let go my body and my two feet and my two hands, or I'll call all the other monkeys to help me image of wax did not let go then the monkey made such an uproar with his cry and shouts that very soon monkeys came running from all directions there were big monkeys and little monkeys and middle-sized monkeys a whole army of monkeys had come to the aid of the biggest monkey it was the very littlest monkey who thought of a plan to help the biggest monkey out of his plight the monkeys were to climb up into the biggest tree and pile themselves one on top of another until they made a pyramid of monkeys. The monkey with the very loudest voice of all was to be on top, and he was to shout his very loudest to the sun and ask the sun to come and help the biggest monkey out of his dreadful difficulty. This is what all the big-sized, little-sized, middle-sized monkeys did. The monkey with the loudest voice, on top of the pyramid, made the sun hear, and the sun came at once. The sun poured his hottest rays down upon the wax. After a while, the wax began to melt. The monkey was at last able to pull out one of his hands. The sun poured down more of his hottest rays, and soon the monkey was able to pull out his two hands. Then he could pull out one foot, then another and in a little while his body too. At last he was free. When the little old woman saw what had happened, she was very much discouraged about raising bananas. She decided to move to another part of the world where she raised cabbages instead of bananas. The monkeys were left in possession of the big garden full of banana trees. From that day to this, the monkeys have thought that they own all the bananas. End of chapter 12